Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here today again on behalf of the IPCP, International Panel on Chemical Pollution. The IPCP is international network of academic scientists working on various aspects of chemical pollution. And this webinar series is part of the PAPS in Plastics um, project, which is part of Jeff funded effort on capacity building and monitoring. Um, the IPCB is very thankful to uh, Dr. Roland Weber for his leadership of this project and to all speakers and collaborators, as well as to uh, Lisa Zvereva from University of Toronto for as her assistance um, with uh, the webinars. Uh, today is the second day of the third part of the webinar series on extraction, cleanup, and analysis of PAPs and plastics. Uh, previous sessions have been recorded and are either already on the IPCP website uh, or will be posted soon. Um, I am very much looking forward to, uh, to continuing learning with you all today. and. Um, while the recordings will be available at a later date, as I mentioned, uh, today's sessions uh, is interactive, so you can submit your uh, questions via the chat um, chat functions, and uh, this gives you an opportunity uh, to ask clarifying questions uh, of of the presenters. Before we start uh, the webinar, Dr. Roland Weber will. Uh, provide a few uh, introductory words and walk you through the agenda. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Anna, for the for the introduction. Yeah, good day uh, to everybody. Thank you for joining our um, fifth and last uh, webinar day. Um, today uh, is specialized on uh, the analysis, instrumental analysis of uh, POPs in plastic, um, where we will start. Uh, with the instrumental analysis of, of prominated POPs uh, with two presentations, and uh, then uh, coming to the analysis of uh, the chlorinated paraffins uh, with different uh, instruments, low resolution and high resolution um, methods. Then uh, we will have a, a break, and afterwards, um, Dr. Gruber will introduce to the instrumental analysis of the new listed POPs, uh, Dechloran Plus and uh, UV328 with instrumental analysis. I will give a presentation on the second part on the draft guidance on sampling, screening, and analysis of POPs in products and recycling. And um, the last uh, topic presentation will come from uh, Dr. Pinish about bioanalysis of POPs and other endocrine disrupting chemicals uh, in plastic. And uh, finally, uh, UNEP, um, Sandra Averu Monri will uh, close our uh, webinar, and um, we will have uh, then finally also some more questions and discussions. Um, coming to the first presentation, which is from uh, Dr. Natsuko Kashiwara. She is from the National Institute of Environmental Studies in Japan. Uh, Dr. Kashiwara is a chief senior researcher in the material cycle division and does research on additive ke uh, chemicals um, in uh, products and uh, in uh, recycling cycles. Um, she and her laboratory is part of our UNEP IPCP CHEF project on monitoring uh, POPs uh, in plastic and uh, her presentation uh, today, it's already now her uh, third presentation in the session is on instrumental analysis of uh, prominated POPs. Yeah, over to you, Dr. Kashiwara. Okay, you thank you very screen. much, Lauren, for a nice introduction. Yeah, I'm going to share my presentations. Yes. Um, can you see I mean, my presentation? Yes. Is everything yes, fine? Already in full screen. Yeah. Okay, so my name is Natsuko Kajiwala from National Institute of Environmental Studies, Japan. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the instrument analysis of brominated POPs, including PPDs and HBCDs. Okay, this is my 
talk today. We have I have three parts today, and first I'm going to give a brief introduction, and then I'm going to introduce a simplified GC method for PBDs and HPCDs in plastic waste. And then in the last section, I will show you the results of inter-laboratory study we conducted last several years. And this slide summarizes the brominate pops used as plastic additives. And they have been widely used in variety of plastic and the concentration in treated products are usually on the order of concentration order of percentage as shown here. Like for the PBDs, sometimes it's the concentration is up to 40% by weight. And for HPCDs, it depends on the product, like but by like 40% in textile or like 0.5% in EPS and 5% in XPS. And the, in order to comply with the provisions of the Stockholm and Basel conventions and also, the EU have the lowest directives. So, to comply those regulations, the chemical analysis is essential to identify products and waste containing PBDs and HPCDs. And it should be noted that when measuring pops in products and waste, the target concentrations are many orders of magnitude higher than measuring the backyard atmosphere of less milk samples. And so from next slide, I, I'd like to show some of the concentration in actual products and waste. For like the first one is about the CLDT recasing, and we have detected like up to 12% of PBDs. This is mostly decabedes. And um, we have lots of textile frame retorted by HBCDs and also PBDs. And most of the frame retorted cartons in Japan was treated by HBCD from like two to four percentage, but some of the PBD in more than 10% by weight. And this picture are showing the building insulation forms. And we have two different types of insulation form, including EPS and XPS. And usually EPS contain less HPCD than HPC XPS. And um, for EPS, HPC concentration is about up to 0.5%, but for XPS, usually XP, HPC concentration is about 4%. And this is the case of the vehicles. We tried to analyze lots of the internal, in, inter, internal material of the vehicles. And some of them contain high concentration of decabedes, like the seed fabric. And some of the seed fabric contain also pentabedes. And seed puff contain like 40% of pentabedes. And like floor covering also contains, some of them contain decabedes and some contain HPCDs. And also like the furniture, like sofa and the couches, they have the fabric and also polyurethane form. But actually in Japan, we don't have very strict regulation of frame redundancy to the furniture. So we don't have, we don't usually detect the PPDs or HPCD from furniture materials, but sometimes like as shown here, like a polyurethane form from sofa, they contain like 0.2% of PPDs. And some like this kind of polyurethane written form chips contain some frame retardants also. And this is the case of the infant and child car seats. And car seats are, I think it's mandatory to have the frame retardancy, like a car interior. And we found like seat fabric of the car, child car seat, 0.1% of PBDs. And also the urethane form inside of the car seat, they contain like 2% of pentabidi or 4% of decabidis. And this is interesting to introduce, like, like the child car seat also contain some parts of EPS and contain the HPCG about like 1%. So for to proper management of the 
products and waste containing pops, we need to identify those products. And the concentration we need to target is like several hundred to more than 1% of PBDs or HBCD. So I think we need to, the strategy to analyze the compounds in products or waste is slightly different from the chemical analysis in like background atmosphere or like breast milk. So we, from next slide, I'd like to show some of our proposed method to very simple method to analyze BFRs like PBDs and HPCD in plastic samples and plastic waste. And this slide summarizes the instruments usually used for PBD and HPCD analysis. For PBDs, we usually use the, like GC high resolution MS or GMS MS to analyze each drugs or each continent in very low concentrations and we need very high sensitivities. And for HPCD, it is very common to use LCMS MS to analyze isomers specific concentrations in samples. Because uh, like this is a high, the photos of high resolution MS, and this is for the LC MS MS. Um, for us, also these are quite expensive and not easy to buy like a very many times. And because introducing this kind of state of the art analytical equipment or method for, for BFRs analysis to Recycling facilities or like collection points in each country is not very practical. So we try to develop a simple and inexpensive analytical method using existing very general purpose equipment. So we selected normal GCMS, I put here, and GCECD for this purpose. And as I mentioned before, the concentration of PBD and HBCDs in plastic products and waste are pretty high. So we don't need to analyze very, very low concentrations. And also for the, regarding HBCD, there are HBCD usually contain five major isomers and they can be separated only by LC, but not by GC. But to identify waste containing HPCDs, isomer information is not necessary, and the total HPCD concentrations analyzed by GC is sufficient. So I think the GCQMS and GCECD is one of the good instruments for analyzing PBDs and HPCD in waste and products. And one more our idea as shown here is to use very short GC column to, to use this instrument. And this is a very simple way. We just cut like, like five, 50 meter usual column to for into three, five meter columns. And to use those columns, there are several advantages. For example, we can reduce, of course, we can reduce the cost and also we can reduce the GC analysis time. And also we can reduce impact of pyrolysis. This figure shows the total ion chromatograms obtained from the GC MS analysis of standard mixtures of PBDs and HPCD by using a five meter GC column and also the 50 meter GC column. And this is more usual way, and this is our proposal this time. And as you can see here, the separation of the major isomers of PBDs and also HBCDs here occurred within six minutes. So it's very quick. And if we compare with the five meter GC column and 15 GC column, we can say like the retention time of BD209 is 10 minutes faster in when we use a five meter GC column. And also the sensitivity of BD209 increased when we use the five meter GC column. So we concluded like the five meter GC column method can be used for pop screening. 
And this I shows of analytical steps for PBDs and HPC analysis in plastic samples. For GCEC analysis, we don't use carbon-13 isotope level internal standards. So if we select GC ECD for PBDs and HPC analysis, it can significantly reduce further analytical costs. The accuracy of this simplified method was validated using seven certified reference materials as shown here. With those materials, they have the, their certified concentrations. And we compare the data analyzed by GCMS and GCECD. And also for the, we tried to analyze the mixed plastic waste samples we just collected around Japan. And we, those samples, we don't have any certified value. So we tried to analyze by GC high resolution. And they compare it with the data obtained from GCQMS and GCCD. As shown here, the average concentration obtained by the simplified method were comparable with their certified values for these samples, and also the data analyzed by GC higher resolution MS or LCMS MS. So from this data, we concluded that this method can be applied to plastic waste to check if it succeeded LPC or not. If you are interested to know more in detail of this method, please refer to these publications. Uh, and this is one more thing I would like to mention. Listen to, we tried to add decorum plus to this simplified method and confirm that DP can be also analyzed simultaneously with PBD and HPCD. Okay, so from next slide, I'd like to move on to the next topic on interlab study for PBDs and HPCDs in plastic waste. To evaluate the accuracy of the simplified GC method we developed and to introduce this method as widely as possible to contribute to proper management of global plastic waste containing pop BFRs, we conducted two rounds of international in interlaboratory comparisons of quantitative analysis of PBDs and HBCDs in plastic waste. As shown here, and as first round we conducted in 19, uh, 2019, the standard solutions and plastic extracts were used for test samples. And the second round test in 2020, CLTTV casing, car fabric, and insulation boards, and also extracts of O2 shred uh, residue ASRs were distributed to participants. For the first round test, 35 laboratories from inside and outside of Japan were participated. And for the second round test, 26 laboratories were participated. And for all the participants, we ask to analyze the test samples using the, the simplified method we propose and also the usual in-house method they use by each laboratory. So we ask them to submit this data from these two different methods and compare the data in next slide. And this slide shows the results for PPD analysis on five test samples. The simplified method is showing the orange here showed a bit larger variation than in-house methods. But for the predominant conditioner, the data BDs, BD-209, and total PPD concentrations, the variations were within the acceptable range of 20%. For HBCDs, again, simplified method showed a bit larger variations, but the CV percent were all below 30%, mostly like 20%. So we concluded this is also in good agreement. So we believe that these interlab results confirm the reliability of the simplified method we proposed. The test reports on our interlab studies are available. 
and test the samples, including CLTTV casing, car fabric, and also EPS and XPS are still available and can be provided. So please contact us if you need a copy of the this kind of report of this study, or if you are interested in analyzing these in the lab samples, please feel free to contact me. And I hope that this method and what I talk today will be useful to, to countries that are starting to analyze bromid pops in their waste and products. Okay, that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Natsuko. Uh, I mean, for the presentation, for your support uh, for this project, but also uh, for supporting uh, researchers in, in developing countries, um, partly also with, with such kind of inter, inter laboratory uh, studies and uh, the methods with reduced costs is of course uh, also very much appreciated uh, by uh, all researchers, but especially by researchers which uh, have uh, reduced uh, funding uh, for their for their uh, research. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Omotayo Sindiku. Um, she is senior researcher and lecturer at the uh, Leed Un City University in Ibadan, uh, Nigeria. Um, she has uh, researched now for more than 10 years on prominated flame retardants, uh, partly in plastic and in the environment. And um, her talk will be on the instrumental analysis of uh, prominated POPs with the gas chromatograph um, uh, ECD uh, method. Um, and uh, we thought it's uh, quite useful. The ECD method is, uh, is uh, robust. And as Natsuko already mentioned, does not need a carbon 13 standards. So therefore it's a relatively uh, uh, a cheap method. And as Omotayo will show, it's also uh, reliable. Yeah. Omotayo, over to you. Um, so I have checked uh, with Dr. Omotayo Sindiku. It is raining in Nigeria, so therefore the, the internet is, is, is not good. So, but we also uh, have a backup uh, of uh, Dr. Sindiku's talk. So therefore, Lisa, if you can try to share the recorded talk of Omotayo, then we cannot hear her live, uh, but uh, we can play her recording. And um, but if you have then questions uh, to Dr. Sindiku, you can put it in the chat, and uh, she is online and uh, can then answer either by chat or maybe later on when the rain stops in Nigeria, she can also talk again. Yeah. So please, Lisa, um, play the recording. Hello, everyone. I am Omotayo Sindiku, and I welcome everybody to this webinar series on POPs and plastics and monitoring approaches. I am going to be talking on analyzing and quantifying bromelated flame retardants, BFRs, with GCECD in electronic waste plastics. A few years back in Nigeria, a monitoring program was initiated to measure the amount of Bromelated flame retardants in electronic waste plastics being imported into Nigeria. During this project, we collected 300, 382 samples comprising of 158 television CRT casings and 224 computer CRT casings from eight different locations in southwest Nigeria. The samples were selected from different sites as shown in the diagram A to F, waste storage sites, electronic workshop sites, road sites, dump sites, and dismantling sites, all in Southwest Nigeria. The samples collected were labeled, noted for their year of manufacture, region of importation and after that small pieces of each of the samples were cut approximately about 100 to 50 mm and these were packaged as shown by the diagram and sent to Van Hover Institute in Germany for analysis few years a few weeks sorry few weeks after that I also traveled to Germany 
to learn the analysis of BFR using GCCD and GMS. After extractions and cleanup, instrumental analysis for our samples were, was carried out using a gas chromatography coupled with electron capture detector. The GC was, was equipped with a ZB 5HC inferno as stationary phase. Temperature of the GC split and splitless injector and detector was set at 295 and 320 respectively. Why our oven temperature was programmed between 140 degrees Celsius and 325 degrees Celsius. Identification and quantification of our BFR by GCCD was done by comparing the retention time of external technical standards of major commercial octabidi, commercial decabidi, tetrabomobis finohe, and TBP he and TBP he. What we did is that standard technicals are different concentrations of the technical standards of the octa, the deca, the TB were prepared. And this standard were run on the GCECD. The standard were used after running, the standard were used to quantify the amount of BFLs, different BFLs in each plastic samples using external calibration and with the development of calibration curves, which I will show you later. This the, the, this chromatogram was generated when we ran um, a standard, a 10 ppm standard solution of octa BDE. As we all know, the commercial octa BDE standard contains what? Exa BDE, which is BDE 153, BDE 154, octa BDE, BDE 183, and octa BD, which is BD196 and 197 as major contaminants. But we also know that commercial octa standard also has minor amount of what? Nona BD, which is BD207 as shown here, and a very small amount of deca BD. So we were able to get this distinct what? A, a chromatogram of the standard solution. That uh, chromatogram I will show is a chromatogram of a 10 ppm standard solution of decabidi. Commercial decabidi contains largely of what? Decabidi, which is BDE 209. But we also have uh, some nona, which has uh, BDE 207 there. The next one is a, a GCCD chromatogram of a 10 ppm standard solution of TBBPA. This standard were used to develop a calibration curves for quantification. As you can see, this is a distinct peak for TBBPA. The next one is a 10 ppm standard solution of TBPA, showing a distinct peak for what? For TBPB. All these standards were run 10 ppm, 20 ppm to about 50 ppm, and they were used to develop calibration curves quantification. These are examples of the calibration curve of uh, this one shows for TBBPA and this one shows for what? The CABDE, which we use for quantification of the amount of BFR in each of our samples. Next, I will be showing the chromatogram of our, of our samples. Uh, this, uh, we, okay, before I show that, I will show you the chromatogram of a 50 ppm standard mixture of TBBPA TBP, octa BDE, and deca BDE. So we have, you can see from here, for commercial octa, we have BDE 154, BDE 183, and uh, BDE 197, and a little bit of what? BDE 209. We have a distinct uh, chromatogram for TBBP here, and a a chromatogram of what TBP he and also I think we have a very distinct peak for BD209. This is a chromatogram of standard mixture. This were ident uh, BFLs here were identified by comparison of the retention time of the external technical standard of major isomers of commercial octa BD, the KBD, TBBPA, and TBP. -E. The next, as you can see, this is one, this is TBP. The next one I will show is a sample analysis for BFLs 
of Nigerian CRT plastic casing with GCECD. And this is a typical sample, a television plastic samples from Europe. We find that out that it contains what commercial opta with a uh, major exabidi which consists of what the D153, 154, epta, which is 183, and we have also have the 196 and 197. This is 197. And it also contains, like I showed you in the standard, a relative amount of what? non abit which is BD209, and impurities of what? The he. This is, was a distinct diagram, a distinct chromatogram from one of our samples. Another one shows, um, another one shows the chromatogram of a television samples from, from Asia. 150 containing high levels of DECA with low levels of NONA as normally found in commercial DECA. This is a distinct diagram or a distinct chromatogram of BD209 with a little amount, a minor amount of BD207. Then we have uh, the next one is uh, a, a television samples from Europe containing highly concentration of high concentration of deca BDE. We know that commercial deca BDE in CRT plastic are often associated with relative high levels of what? Nona, which is a BD207, which indicates that the original commercial deca BDE has been partially debrominated in the weathering of the CRT casings over the decades in African zones. Even during usage, we find out that most of the ones we collected from homes even add what? The DECA in them, being debrominated to what? Um, 207. The next one we have, the next chromatogram is a GCECD chromatogram of a CRT computer from America containing mixtures of BFR. Here we find the TBPA, commercial hopta, and DECA at low levels, indicating that it has been likely pro being produced partly from what? Recycling flame retardant plastics. You can see the chromatogram was not so straight, but we managed to. This is a distinct peak for TBPA. We have BD183, TBPA. BD197 showing commercial octa, and we have a BD207, which is non BD, and we have a distinct peak for a distinct chromatogram for BD209. Most of the quality control protocols were, we, that were observed during the PBD analysis were we make sure that the BFR analysis we did was performed according to standard. The GCECD was calibrated each work day, every day, in order to check for the linearity and sensitivity of the GCECD. Our limit of quantification was calculated from the lowest calibration level, and this accounted for about 10 to 25 ppm polymer. This level was uh, were above the lowest provisional Basel convention, low POPs limit of 50 milligram per kilogram for BDEs, and 100 milligram per kilogram for HBCD. Therefore, I can say that this method is able to quantify samples according to Basel Convention requirements. Also, we make sure that blank injection was done to check for cross-contamination cross between one extract sample, extracted samples to another. This is to prevent what cross-contamination and some conclusion on using that I learned on using GCCD for BFLs analysis of VI plastics. I can say that GC has excellent sensitivity for brominated flame retardants. Levels of BFLs in plastic are we know they are usually high and they are easily detectable. The GCCD detects all BFLs that we injected into it, therefore, it is suitable for monitoring recycled plastic products, often containing what? Multiple BFRs. One advantage of ECD is its, is its robustness. 
the GCCD can be heated to about 350 degrees Celsius and some can also go as high as 400 degrees Celsius. A thermal cleaning can be performed and this will be beneficial for most plastic samples. Due to their reasonable price, at least they are not as expensive as GCMS and robustness, ECD are also available in developing countries. And well, they are available because they are easy to maintain. They have low maintenance cost, cost and we have good experience. Thank you for your attention. I hope I have been able to convince you that GCECD is a robust word method for determination of BFR in e-waste plastic. Thank you. Bye. Yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Omotayo, uh, for this uh, good uh, recorded uh, presentation and for uh, yes, uh, showing uh, also how um, such monitoring uh, in Nigeria uh, can work in, in, in cooperation uh, in the South uh, North cooperation with, uh, with Germany. There is uh, one uh, question directly to your presentation. So here it's, may I ask which steps were carried out in Nigeria and other steps in other countries? What uh, portable instruments were used uh, in Nigeria? So uh, Omotayo, are you online? Can we, is the connection good enough? Yes, hello Roland, I'm here. Yes, yeah. did you hear the question? Yes, I, I had, it. I've seen it. Question. Now, the steps that, are carried, that were carried out in Nigeria was just that we collected most of the plastic samples in Nigeria. The televisions and the computer samples were collected in Nigeria. Then the sample preparation was also done in Nigeria. I, I think uh, in one of the slides, I show some of the instruments we use in cutting the samples according to the sizes. While after that, I think that was all the things we did in Nigeria. And the next step in this, which involved the screening, the analysis of ECD was done in, in Germany at Fraunhofer Institute for the Plastic. But I think after, from my experience, after learning CBD analysis in, my, in Germany, I was able to transfer that. And we did, for we analyzed uh, CBDs in egg, milk, soy samples, and in some what in some plant samples using ECD in Nigeria, we have ECD in Nigeria. We're able to procure the, uh, all the other equipment. So those are the things we do. Thank you. Yes. So this means uh, our first study in 2011. Uh, at that time, uh, no instrument was available in Nigeria. Uh, neither the XRF uh, nor the instrumental analysis. So therefore, at that time. Um, let's say the, the, the laboratory work has been done uh, in Germany. Meanwhile, uh, yes, there is an ECD uh, in Nigeria, but also GCMS uh, in, in, in Ibadan. Uh, and uh, over the time, uh, especially from UNIDO projects, they have yeah. brought a range of XRF um, yeah. equipment um, during the national implementation plan updates uh, to the developing countries. And at the moment also for our project in Ivory Coast, uh, where we have a capacity building on PBDE analysis uh, for e-waste and end-of-life vehicle. Uh, we have uh, purchased uh, XRF uh, screening uh, tool for Ivory Coast, and here the team is at the moment screening. And the next step is that we also uh, build capacity to analyze uh, PBDE and, and, and HBCD here in, in Ivory Coast. Yeah, so uh, the, th that process uh, is, is, is slow. Uh, and and needs uh, really dedicated uh, uh, capacity building, but it is um, on the way in in different countries. Um, so coming uh, to the next presentation of uh, Dr. Yannick uh, Sprengel. Uh, Yannick, you can uh, uh, put on your presentation. Dr. Yannick Sprengel is uh, head of laboratory in the department for consumer goods at the CVUA uh, Stuttgart. That's a governmental institute for um, consumer uh, protection. And uh, his presentation is on analysis of short chain chlorinated paraffins and medium chain chlorinated paraffins with low resolution uh, GCMS. 
Over to you, Yannick. Yes, thank you very much, Roland, for the kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity to present, uh, to hold this presentation about the quantification of short and medium chain CPs via gas chromatography coupled to low resolution mass spectrometry. Um, as Roland already said, I'm working at the CVUA in Stuttgart, um, not currently in the field of CPs, but I performed my PhD thesis on the field of CPs at the University of Hohenheim between 2017 and 2021, which is where the data and the experience I will want to share with you today comes from. And um, I approached this presentation not as a purely theoretical presentation, but more as a, a practical guide for anyone who wants to start or update their analysis of CPs with this GCMS um, setup. Um, you already heard a bit about CP, so I'll keep the introduction short. Just to recap, chlorinated paraffins or CPs are polychlorinated analkanes, which were man-made. That means structurally they um, have this analkane backbone and are substituted with chlorine atoms at different carbon atoms. The industrial um, products, CP products, are synthesized via free radical chlorination of paraffin feedstocks, which results in highly complex mixtures of several thousand compounds, which are structurally very similar. And the CPs are usually subdivided into three main groups. First, the short chain CPs or SCCPs with 10 to 13 carbon atoms then the medium chain CPs or MCCPs with 14 to 17 carbon atoms, and finally long chain CPs with more than 17 carbon atoms. Because these mixtures are so complex, they, the CPs have been called the most challenging group of substances with respect to analysis and quantification. And consequently, there is not one single best instrumental setup to analyze them. Between 2017 and 2020, 18 different instrumental setups were used for CP quantification, and each one of these has their own advantages and disadvantages. Still, the most often used setup is gas chromatography coupled to electron capture negative ionization, low resolution mass spectrometry, which was about a third of the published papers in this time period, where the um, advantage is, of course, that it's a very affordable instrument, and once the analysis is set up, it is a very robust workhorse, so to speak. LC methods, as you've, as you've heard in the previous presentation, um, are also on the rise um, in the field of S and MCCPs and are pretty much required when you want to analyze LCCPs, as we will see um, in the next slides. The sample preparation that we conducted was always pretty basic. We first had to extract the CPs from the matrix. Depending on how complex the matrix is, it could be a direct cold extraction or um, maybe an accelerated solvent extraction for more difficult matrices. Then we destroyed the matrix substances that were um, would otherwise disturb the quantification with sulfuric acid. We applied it directly. And sometimes it had to be applied twice if the matrix contained a lot of oxidizable substances. Finally, um, polar um, matrix substances were uh, removed with column chromatography with deactivated silica gel. Although you've also heard in the presentation about the LC method, you could combine the sulfuric acid and silica gel steps by impregnating the silica gel with the um, sulfuric acid. And the sample um, extracts that we obtained were diluted accordingly and then measured in the, on the GCMS instrument. The parameters that we used for um, the injector for the GC was a program temperature vaporizer, which um, allowed for a more conservative temperature program in on the inlet, but you could also use a, the usual split splitless injector for cheese for the CP analysis. But you should always make clear sure that your liner is clean and deactivated because as soon as the any residues are forming, the response for CPs goes pretty fast downhill. We used helium as a carrier gas at a constant flow of 
about 1.2 milliliters. And also a pretty basic oven temperature program starting at 50 degrees and then ramping slowly up to 300 degrees, um, resulting in, an, in a runtime of about 40 minutes. Um, we will see later why this long um, temperature program is also um, is an advantage. The column phases we used were also pretty standard. Um, we mostly used DB5 phases, but you could also use DBU1 because it's not that important. The separation of CPs is only achieved through the boiling point, not through any interaction with the material. We preferred a longer column of about 30 meters, but you could also um, make it work with a shorter 15 meter column. The mass spectrometer was um, operated in a electron capture negative ionization mode, um, only detecting the negative ions with methane at a high purity as the moderating gas at a certain pressure. And most importantly, for CP quantification, we uh, all measurements were done in the SIM mode because a full scan is way too insensitive to quantify CPs. Um, because CPs are always present in complex mixtures, they are not separable through chromatographic means. So when you see a chromatogram, for example, like this one, um, you always see this characteristic hump peak which looks a bit like a mountain range and eludes over several minutes. The instrumental response of the CPs is highly influenced by chlorination degree. So the amount of chlorine atoms in the chain. And this is the, um, the problem that most quantification methods have to deal with. As a basis for our analysis and research, um, we used a method published by Reet et al in the year 2005, which was um, published as a method to quantify SCCPs as some parameters, but it was also um, noted that it could similarly be used to quantify MCCPs. Long chain CPs are not quantifiable via gas chromatography because as we can see in this chromatogram here, sorry, oh, um, because as we can see in the lower chromatogram that the longer the chain gets, the lower the response gets. And because these compounds are not volatile enough to be analyzed via GC. Um, now to show you the principle of the quantification method, the original rate method only distinguished between the sum parameters of SCCPs and MCCPs. And um, the, um, for each homolog group, so for each uh, sum formula, um, we monitored the dechlorinated ion, so the M minus minus Cl ion for each chain length and from containing four to originally it was 10 chlorine atoms, but for higher chlorination degrees, there are also more chlorine atoms, so um, could go up to 14 chlorine atoms, for example. So if you want to check the C10 Cl8 homolog group, we look at the dechlorinated ion C10 Cl7 minus and then we monitor the most and the second most abundant isotopes. In this case, the masses 381 and 383. If we measure all SCCP and MCCP homolog groups together, it, uh, it would amount to about 100 ions. So we needed a, um, actually quite a few runs per sample. When we measured both S and MCCPs, we usually used one run per chain length. So eight runs to analyze one sample. The problem, because we're working with a low resolution, is that there are multiple overlaps possible between the CPs. The first one is an overlap with CPs that are two carbon atoms apart. So again, looking at the C10Cl8 homolog group, this is um, overlapped by a C12Cl6 ion which forms the same mass as 381 and 383 here. Um, when we have both um, chain lengths separated, it looks like this. But if both are um, at the same time present in a sample, which they mostly are, we see that they both chain lengths co elute and we cannot separate them through chromatography. But the solution to this problem is also visible because we can see that the isotopic ratio between both masses is pretty different for both chain lengths. So we know the isotopic ratio of our target 
analyte and of our overlap. And we measure a certain isotopic ratio in our sample. And we simply can calculate the shares of both chain lengths to the peak area with an arithmetic correction. For example, with an equation like this one, which only uses the isotopic ratios and the measured peak area to calculate the peak, um, peak area share of our target analyte. Because the um, isotope ratios only are dependent on the amount of chlorine atoms in the, um, in the molecule, they are always the same for each chain length. And here in this slide, I just want to show you the most common overlaps. First, um, for um, when the longer chain length is more abundant, there are overlaps for the target homologs containing 8 to 12 chlorine atoms. And when uh, shorter chain lengths are more abundant, we have overlaps for more, the target homologs containing 6 to 8 chlorine atoms. We can also see that the isotopic ratios of the target and the overlap are always very far apart, so it's easy to calculate the different shares. The next overlap that is possible comes from CPs that are five carbon atoms in length apart. Again, we look at our C10 Cl7 minus ion, and this is also overlapped by ions formed from the C15 Cl5, Cl5 ion. Um, which, as we see, also forms 381 and 383. Again, if we look at them separate separately in, uh, in a standard, here we see that the isotopic ratios are much more close, but uh, so it's not that easy to calculate it via correction. But here is when the longer um, runtime comes in, because if both are present in the sample, we can already see that they are almost separated through their retention time. So we can simply make a cut in between and say that everything that's on the left side comes from the C10 CPs and everything on the right side is a signal of the C15 CPs. So in this case, it's important to always double check retention times um, from the CPs measured in your sample with those in your standards. This last overlap um, could also be used to an advantage. Um, we didn't implement this in our research, but Zeng et al. Um, published a, a method in 2011 where they combined the measuring of two di different CP chain lengths into one run. Um, as we saw that C10 and C15 form the same um, ions at high abundance. So if you cleverly um, use your quantification and qualification ions, you can um, implement and uh, can measure both chain lengths in one, similarly with C11 and C16 and C12 and C17. And they also managed to simultaneously measure C13 and C14. So this might be a possibility to cut down your uh, measuring time in half. Special attention has then be, uh, to be given to the integration for CL4 and CL5 homolog groups. Because here, um, as I mentioned earlier, the response of the CPs is very much influenced by their amount of chlorine atoms. So the less chlorine atoms there are, the, the lower the response is. And for CL4 and 5, the response is very low. And because it is so low here, uh, additional overlaps come into play which originate from higher chlorinated homologs of the same chain length. So even if you only have only one chain length, these overlaps are still visible. For example, here, when we want to um, look at the C14, CL4 homolog group at a low chlorination degree, we only see the signal from the original um, CL, C14, CL4. But already at a medium chlorination degree, we have um, those peaks from higher chlorinated homologs that form the same, um, the same ions. Here, the solution is just to gain experience and to get to know the behavior of the CPs with your method. We found that, for example, the addition of one chlorine atom to the chain is all um, adds a pretty constant amount of elution time. So, for example, if I know that Cl5 eludes one minute after Cl4, then Cl6 eludes one minute after Cl5, and Cl7 one minute after Cl6, and so on. Also, we found that with the program that we used, 
the peak width was very similar for each homolog group. Um, as shown in this example, C14 CL6 was a bit more than two minutes in peak width, which also was true for the C14 CL4. But this is only a, a rule of thumb because the more chlorine atoms get added, the broader the peak gets. So it only works up to a certain amount of chlorine atoms. Um, taking both together, it is very important to um, always compare the illusion ranges and the peak widths in, from the sample and the standards to correctly identify any true CL4 and CL5 homologs and not to integrate only ghost peaks from other homologs. Then um, you will certainly encounter matrix effects because we measure 100 different ions. No matter how clean your sample gets, you will encounter an overlap with matrix or any other substance. Here, the solution is simple to just integrate the shared area and subtract any onset peaks. Here in this example, we see that there is this uh, characteristic hump peak of the CPs, but it is also overlap with several onset peaks, which are not characteristic for CP mixtures. We can also see when we compare it with our standard that the, um, how it should look like. And so we just integrate the respective elution time from our standard as a total area, and then we just integrate the onset peaks and subtract them to get the pure peak area from our CP. When we've um, integrated everything correctly, the final homolog patterns should look close to a Gaussian curve for each and every chain length. This has been first described by Gao et al. in 2016. It has since then used for different quantification processes. For example, Bo Yuan used it for a method with high resolution mass spectrometry. But, and we also used it um, to always to check if everything was right in our own quantification process. Because if any of these homolog groups would uh, deviate from this Gaussian curve, something probably is not right with the integration. Now back to the method by Reet et al. The original method um, proposed the formation of a total response factor, which simply meant that you added up all your SCCP or MCCP homolog group areas together and then um, divided them by the concentration of the standard. Then the, they performed a linear regression of this total response factor over the chlorine content of the mixture. This is very important to note that it's not cal um, calibrated over the mass range because the mass is already integrated into the total response factor. Um, and when, we, uh, when using commercially available mixed standards, which were available in three different chlorination degrees. And we also added one plus one mixtures to get a five point calibration curve. We got about these um, measurements. Um, you will note that the chlorination degree that was certified on the standard and the one that was calculated from this method deviate quite strongly from each other. This is because the um, response Correction was only done after the chlorination degree uh, was calculated. The original rate method um, proposed a linear regression, which gives a pretty good fit for the SCCPs, but we can see for MCCPs, it's um, not that good. Now, what we observed pretty early on is that always the standards showed not really a linear um, response behavior, but if you watch closely, you can see it's more like a curve in both cases or even more pronounced for the MCCPs. So we made a, made a seemingly small change and just um, changed the calibration curve from linear to exponential. But this already gave a much better fit for both S and MCCPs. Um, and it seems like a very small change, but actually when I first presented these, these findings, um, I got feedback from other scientists who said that they also observed this effect that it looked more like a curve, but they didn't think about changing the calibration curve. So if you notice anything that seems to help you, maybe just try it and see if it actually is, gets better. And we, with this exponential method, we um, achieved 
pretty satisfying results on an interlaboratory study, um, which gave um, deviations from the target value of about 25% for SCCPs. Um, and, oh, sorry, and very good value of only 4% deviation for MCCPs. And even when both were present in the same mixture, the deviations were below 30%. Now, if you want to go um, get even more exact, you could switch from the use of um, mixed standards to single chain CP standards, which are now um, commercially available or can be synthesized um, by yourself through pretty easy means. The, um, the method works um, almost the same with the main difference being that you not calibrate for the sum parameters of S and MCCPs, but differently for each chain length, for example, for C11, C12, C13, C16, and so on. And this allows for an even more precise quantification when using the single chain CPs. The values from the same um, interlaboratory study gave almost spot on values for S and MCCPs when they were separately in the sample. And when they were together, the deviations were below 20%. The main advantage when using these single chain CPs is that you can form homolog group specific response factors because um, the original rate method only um, accounted for the response of the whole mixture. But of course, in reality, every single molecule has its own response. We cannot separate the single molecules. So we have to do with the next best thing, which is the homolog groups. And we can calculate the response factors for each homolog group if we have single chain length standards. So we set up this matrix of response factors, they were um, found out iteratively. And all those response factors are applied before calculating the total response factor. So you just take your raw peak area, multiply them with all those um, response factors. And after that, you calculate your total response factor. This not only improved the, um, the preci precision of the method, but it also allowed for an exact determination of the chlorine content of the CPs in the sample. Because we saw earlier with the original method, the calculated chlorine contents deviated strongly from the actual chlorine contents. When using these response factors, you can quite accurately calculate the actual chlorine content. And it is important to note that these response factors that are shown in this table are not set in stone. They are different for each setup and depending on um, the um, any um, instrumental um, setups that you use. For example, Maizière et al. proposed different correction factors for M and S, S and MCCPs for their GC MS um, instrument. So to conclude, the GC electron capture negative ionization low resolution mass spectrometry allows for precise and robust quantification of both S and MCCPs. When using single chain length standards, you could specifically quantify the single chain lengths and you can determine the chlorine content of the CPs in the sample. To achieve that, you need to put in a bit of work. You need an experienced analyst or an analyst who is willing to dive deep and gain knowledge about the CPs in this method. You need adequate standards. At least you should use certified standard mixtures, not any um, industrial CP product. And even better if you can get your hands on single chain standards and you need a rigorous quality assurance to make sure that everything on the, um, on the end of integration and calculation was done correctly. And most importantly, you should know your setup, how the CPs behave in, in your environment and stay creative and do not fear to try something new and see if it actually improves your quantification method. So that's what I wanted to share with you today and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Yannick, for this uh, excellent presentation. Um, and uh, I think uh, it was also one idea of uh, Professor Vetter uh, to have uh, such a method uh, which can be then used uh, also in developing countries with this uh, low resolution uh, 
uh, uh, method. Um, we have uh, one question directly to you. This is, uh, may I ask R squared, I mean nonlinear, is 0 0.999, and how you can explain it is overfitting and or underfitting? Sorry. Um, yes, um, I think I have to go back to that because I don't know the values by heart. Um, or I'll just look it up here in my own presentation. Um, I guess the, ah, yeah, um, for the um, exponential calibration curve, the fitting was 0 0.999 for SCCPs and 990 for MCCPs. Yes, they, so the fit was um, pretty good and it was always um, pretty good when using the exponential curve. Um, I'm not sure I know what you mean with regarding overfitting or underfitting. I mean, of calculation or under calculation. I mean, when you quantify, I think maybe. Yes. Ah, it was all. Ah, yes. I, I, now I know. Uh, the deviations, they were always um, underestimations. So underfitting, it was um, no um, over. Um, no, no over evaluation of the values. We always found too low values. But of course, depending on where you land on your calibration curve when using the linear approach, it could be could, could go both ways. Um, apart from the interlaboratory study, we also found samples where we very much overestimated the CP quantification with this linear approach. And this got much better when we changed to the exponential curve. Okay, so um, then, I mean, when you quantify um, how much percent or what factor uh, you would consider that you are correct uh, with the SCCP, and I know that for the MCCP, it's more complicated and there is a bigger variation. So can you make some guess uh, about this uh, overestimation, underestimation? Um, Let's say first from the commercial standards and then afterwards maybe also from your single standards. Um, yes, um, I think um, the, the main effect when we used the commercial standards was that these standards, um, we didn't know how much of each chain length was present in these mixtures. So we could only calibrate as a sum parameter, but we I showed you when using the single chain standards that the response was slightly different for each chain length. So if the chain length um, distribution between the sample and your standard was was very was not very close, that also could um, influence the um, values um, quite significantly. I would say, yeah. Significantly, then this is rather than a, a factor of of uh, of wrong calculation, right? Not only 10, 20 percent. Um, um, yes, it, it could. Um, it could. I, I'm I'm not sure if we, if it would go to orders of magnitude. That probably not, but about um, yeah, 30, 50, up to 50 percent in the worst case. Probably that's that's quite possible. Yes. Okay, and. Um, I mean, you said uh, improvement was done uh, by your single chain standards. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you said now it's also available commercially, but uh, I think your group was the first one uh, which synthesized them in the laboratory. Maybe can, can you tell uh, how complicated it is uh, <laughs> to synthesize such standards? And um, yeah, if uh, I mean, some experience from your group Yes, um, the, the synthesis itself is pretty easy. You actually only need the alkane that you want to synthesize, for example, decane for the C10, and you need a chlorine source. We used a sulfur chloride, and then you add um, um, UV irradiation. So you pretty much simulate the industrial production process. After that, you need to clean up your product. That's probably the most complicated part because there when we used sulfur chloride, there was some sulfur containing side products and we needed to remove them using liquid. Um, it could be done either by liquid chromatography, which colleagues in Switzerland have done, or we used something called countercurrent chromatography, which is uh, basically a shaking flask in instrumental form. 
Um, yeah. So um, you have to, the most difficult thing is, I think, to really clean up these raw products that you produce. Producing the raw product is pretty simple because you only need basically two chemicals and sunlight. <laughs> Good. So that that's uh, relatively cheap, right? And uh, you have, I think, produced in gram scale. Yes, you, you can scale it up um, depending on how much your uh, how big your flasks are, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I think in the beginning you only had the let's say for short and medium chain. And then later on, you also do a, did a synthesis now for, for the long chain chlorinated paraffins. Uh, one question, have you published this that other people uh, could uh, follow? Yes. Uh, I mean, how you how you produce that? Yes, we published a synthesis procedure. Um, I think um, I, I think I didn't um, send you my presentation, but I can do that. And then I can add also the literature to the synthesis procedure as well. But you can also uh, maybe put it in the chat, you know, if you have it yes. um, um, by hand and then uh, people can 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 look it up uh, because mm -hmm. I know, yes, I mean, that's also one big problem in developing countries. Standards are very expensive. Yes. And uh, if you can synthesize it yourself, um, then, uh, of course, um, this is uh, uh, much, much yes. better. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, the method of Professor Vetter was um, also then uh, from uh, Dr. Guida, uh, which is at the moment in the laboratory of Nice, uh, transferred to Brazil. Uh, Iago, are you are you online? I mean, I, I see you here. If you are online, maybe is it possible to share some of your uh, experience uh, on transferring uh, the knowledge? Uh, to a developing country uh, laboratory. Yeah, it seems that uh, Iago is not not online. And uh, to uh, Natsuko, um, for the quantification, Natsuko, uh, with the LCMS, are you using the commercial mixtures for the quantification? Or do you also have a single uh, chain chlorinated paraffins uh, for for quantification? Hey, Laurent, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah we use the commercial mixtures to quantify the CP hom homologs. But before using, because the commercial mixture, they don't have any certification of the contents. We don't know how much in each commercial mixture. So before to use a calibration standard, we try to analyze the calibration standard, I mean, the, the commercial mixture by orbital mass to know the uh, uh, I mean, precise contents of each homolog. Then we prepare the calibration curve to quantify the CPs in samples. That's the way we are using. So we are not it, using just purchased as it is. We need to analyze the content in the commercial mixtures by different technique. And okay, so this means you do not have uh, any um, individual chain uh, length uh, standards at the moment for quantification? No, we we'll use a mixture. OK. Um, and what is your experience uh, for the long chain chlorinated paraffins? Uh, because I think uh, that the long chain chlorinated paraffins are only possible to be analyzed uh, with the LCMS, which are which are you using? Is this mm -hmm. uh, a similar uh, to short and medium chain, or are there more challenges? I think it's quite similar by using LCMS. -MS. I mean, you mean when we compare analyze MCCP or LCCP by LC, the technique is almost similar. Yeah, but also like the LCCP is also, we don't have, uh, at so far, we don't have the commercial mixture containing the 
much longer chain than the CP is like more than like more than 30 carbon chains. Well, then. So, so those compounds, it's also difficult to quantify. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know that now uh, this Swiss group together with uh, Professor Fetton, so they are also, let's say, uh, producing some of the long chain, uh, single chain uh, mixtures. So maybe uh, it might be uh, an interesting idea to, to exchange here, let's say knowledge and, ma and maybe also to exchange uh, some, some of the, the standards. Yeah. It's, um, Hidenori Matsukami, from the National Institute for Environmental Studies in Japan. Um, he is a senior uh, researcher at the Material Cycle Division of the National Institute of Environmental Studies um, in the same uh, department as uh, Dr. Kashiwara. He is specialized in complex instrumental analysis of POPs, but also other compound classes. His talk is about analysis of uh, short chain chlorinated paraffins and medium chain chlorinated paraffins with uh, LCM SMS. And this talk is recorded. Yeah, Lisa, please. I'm Hidenari Matsukami, working at the National Institute for Environmental Studies, Japan. Here, I would like to present the HCMS method that we have developed to elucidate current situation of waste and consumer products containing chlorinated paraffins. Chlorinated paraffins are complex mixtures of polychlorinated alkanes. CPs are normally classified according to their carbon chain lengths into short chain, medium chain, and long chain containers. Since the 1930s, commercial mixtures of CPs have been produced mainly for use as metal working lubricants and PVC plasticizers. However, there is growing concern about the potential for environmental contamination and human health risks caused by SCCPs. Investigations have shown that SCCPs are chemicals of concern because of their environmental persistence, bioaccumulation, and inherent toxicity. And then recently, SCCPs was listed as a pop under the Stockholm Convention. Following to the Stockholm Convention, SCCP waste at the concentration higher than 100 or 10,000 milligram per kilogram must be destroyed or irreversibly transformed in an environmentally sound manner under the Basel Convention technical guidelines. It seems many special waste containing SCCPs is generated. Then information on the types of waste and consumer products containing SCCPs is crucial for the environmental sound management of SCCP waste. However, little information exists on the waste and consumer products containing SCCPs around the world. Therefore, identification of waste with SCCPs content above the LPC value is needed for their effective environmental sound management. So far, a lot of mass spectrometric approaches have been proposed for the determination of SCCPs. Of this method, HRMS can dissolve homologs yielding ions can reduce background interference and can improve detection accuracy. But not all laboratories and institutions around the world can afford or have access to an HRMS system. Currently, GC, uh, NCI, QMS, is more accessible means for the quantification of 
but this approach requires time consuming cleanup and fractionation of samples to minimize interference from other halogenated compounds. Therefore, a cheaper, uh, more accessible, and uh, practical method for the quantification of SCCPs is needed. Therefore, we developed a novel mass spectrometry method to quantify SCCPs in plastic waste. Using our LCMSMS method, we can identify major CP homologs with good separation and peak width. And then we found that the data obtained by our method were in good agreement with HRMS data. In addition, the LCMSMS system has many additional advantages because the LCMSMS system is useful to measure not only SCCPs but also MCCPs, LCCPs, and PFAS, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and many environmental contaminants. First, I'd like to explain the developed method, our LCMSMS method to screen wastes and consumer products containing SCPs. And this slide shows outline of the developed method to screen waste and consumer products containing CPs. Briefly, after powdering PVC waste and consumer products using a freezer mill, approximately 0.2 gram of each sample was ultrasonically extracted in Turin. The Turin extract was diluted with dichloromethane hexane. Then silica gel impregnated with 55 percent sulfuric acid was added to uh, for cleanup. The supernatant was evaporated, re-dissolved in methanol, and then CPs were measured using FCMSMS system. And the average recoveries of SCCP homologs from the spiked waste uh, were within the range uh, 85 to 104%. And the procedural blanks were analyzed between the, the analysis of samples to check for interference and contamination. And all the target homologs in the procedural blanks were below the method detection limits. And this slide shows the LCMSMS parameters for measuring CPs. A cyan propyl carb, the special carb was used for separating CP congeners. And the ESI in negative mode using a mobile phase composed of water and uh, uh, methanol containing ammonia ammonium acetate were applied for detecting CP congeners. Then we optimized the MSMS uh, monitor ions of CP congeners. The acetate adduct molecules of CP congeners were set as precursor ions. One for uh, acetate ion, and one for the protonated molecule was set up as product ion. And this slide shows MSMS pointer ions of SCCPs. And, uh, and this slide shows MSMS pointer ions of MCCPs. And this slide shows uh, uh, this slide shows the 
uh, MSMS monitor ions of HCCP congeners. And this slide shows the chromatograms of HCCP congeners in uh, EVC samples. A marked development in peak separation was achieved by our LCMSMS method with the, the special uh, cyanopropyl column and MRM uh, MSMS transitions. In addition, uh, 28 congeners of MCCPs were also separated and identified by our LCMSMS method. And uh, uh, 21 congeners of HCCPs were also measured by our LCMSMS method. And then we verified the result by uh, obtained by our LCMSM method. As shown in these two graphs, the result of SCCP congeners contained uh, obtained by our LCMSMS method was significantly correlated with those obtained by HRMS method. A good agreement was observed not only in uh, commercial mixtures, but also in mixed plastic waste between the developed method, our HCMS method, and the HRMS method. Following the analytical method, I'd like to explain the result of the inter-laboratory study for the screening of waste and consumer products contain CPs. And this slide shows the, uh, uh, within this study, uh, we sent four samples of fine powder or EVC based consumer products to the participating laboratories. The EVC toys and, and the electrical electric cores were co uh, collected at 100 yen shop and the home improvement store. And then we powdered and homogenized these samples. And this slide shows the information uh, on the participating laboratories. CPs can be analyzed by uh, FC or DC coupled to MS. So five participants uh, use LCMS in APCI negative mode, and the five participants use DCMS in uh, ECNI, yeah, uh, NCI mode. And the high resolution map. MS system, such as uh, uh, orbit wrap. And uh, uh, TOF MS have potential for analyzing CPs in the PVC samples uh, sensitively and selectively. Then I'd like to show the result from all participants in this study. Almost each participating laboratory analyzed every sample. Based on the results analyzed in this study, the CV values for SCCP increase in the order sample C and A, and D, and B. The CV values are probably more related to the concentration of SCCP than that of SCCPs. When the concentration of SCCP is higher than that of 
MCCT such as EBCC sample. Most of error values against average concentration were acceptable, less than 30%. But when the concentration of MCCPs is higher than that of SCCPs, such as sample B, most of error values against the average value uh, were not acceptable and much higher than those of uh, sample C. In addition, we obtained important data on the proposed LCMSMS method in this study. Our data obtained by the LCMSMS system were good agreement with high resolution MS data. This result indicates that the LCMS method can accurately quantify SCCPs, MCCP, and LCCPs in PVC based consumer products. In conclusion, the present data obtained by uh, our LCMSMS method work both quantitatively and qualitatively comparable with those obtained with high resolution MS, MS system. Our LS LCMSMS method is cheaper, more accessible, and practical to use than HRMS system. And it, sh and it showed a retention with good separation and peak shapes of CP congeners. Finally, we gratefully acknowledge the technical support from our member and research fund by the Environmental Restoration and Conservation Agency in Japan. If you are uh, interested in chemical analysis of CPs in waste and consumer products, please see these papers. Thank you for your kind attention. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Matsukami. Okay, good. So welcome back uh, to the last part of our webinar series. Our next presenter is um, Ludwig Huber from Fraunhofer Institute for Process Engineering and Packaging, uh, Phrasing Germany. He's the head of the Contaminant Laboratory and has worked more than 20 years on contaminants in plastic, very much on food packaging, but also uh, on uh, electronic waste, electronic waste recycling. Um, yesterday, he gave a good introduction into extraction and cleanup of um, pops in plastic, which you can uh, get uh, on our website of IPCP. And uh, today, his presentation is on the two uh, just new listed POPs, instrumental analysis of new listed POPs, Decloran Plus and UV328. Uh, Over to you, Ludwig. Thank you for your introduction. Um, yes, um, I will focus on two um, substance classes, Decloran Plus and UV328. But, um, it is in context with uh, the presentations today and also yesterday, because we performed this uh, measurements uh, with um, methods derived from the work from Japan. And also uh, um, the uh, part of the work has to do with uh, the things Montayo uh, told us today with the ECD. So let's start. You went on mute, um, probably Ludwig. At the moment, we cannot hear you. Yes, um, now? Now you're back. Yeah, so please uh, start, yeah. Okay, so um, 
if you talk about the Quran plus, um, it's not one substance. Um, it's a, a, first of all, so uh, some companies who call the products the Quran, so it's not only the Quran plus. There are also uh, some uh, uh, mixtures which are called the Quran 602 or 603 or 604. And um, the Quran Plus consists also of a sin and an anti isomer. So we talk about a, a group of substances. Um, the original Victorian um, Plus is a substance of very high concern and it's widely detected in the global environment and um, some studies also in indicate increasing concentrations. Um, in the Great Lakes, for example, you will also find uh, Declaran 602, 603 and 604. So it's also present in the environmental uh, areas um, in uh, the northern hemisphere. For the analytical issues, we used an internal standard so, uh, for the Chloran plus anti says one thirteen C ten. Uh, isotope label st standard available cis eases uh, the um, analysis uh, and the quantification. If you talk about UV328, it's a light or better UV stabilizer for a variety of plastics like styrene, acrylic polymers, um, polyesters, PVC, polyolefins, and so on. It's also identified as a substance of very high concern and it's um, um, to, to be listed in the uh, appropriate annex. And to, for a better understanding, the technical use is typically recommended uh, in concentrations between one and three percent. And um, again, um, our colleagues from Japan has, uh, Natsuko has uh, told us uh, that they changed uh, the instrumentation from high resolution mass spectrometry. And to be honest, uh, we were part of this uh, validation project for the uh, Japanese method and for a project together with uh, the Norwegian Environmental Agency, we use this method to, in order to um, analyze the Chloran Plus. So uh, in, in former times, so the last 20 years, we performed the analysis with high resolution MS and our results uh, was uh, uh, suggested uh, method was uh, single quad MS were as good enough to decide to change the instrumentation. Um, why with the Norwegian Environmental Agency? Mm, in the ongoing regular processes, um, for the EU legislation and also the Stockholm Convention, um, the Norwegian Environment Agency to, um, is the responsible um, uh, authority for uh, preparing this uh, documents. So uh, the game was to collect information on the presence of uh, Decoran Plus and other substances of concern and post-consumer waste. Um, it's a bit complicated to get really um, the appropriate samples, so it took us a lot of time to gather with Rumble um, to, uh, to get this uh, post-consumer waste samples, which were really useful to be analyzed. And as a matter of fact, we only uh, got 
26 uh, samples and um, the chlorine plus was only detected five times. Uh, the chlorine related compounds were not found at all. And uh, for um, better understanding and more information, you can download the report, which uh, is vi visible on, on the presentation. You can download it from the internet. It's available uh, through the Norwegian Environment Agency. So let's start how we perform the analysis. So I have some minor problem with. So um, as I mentioned, it was not only uh, the chlorine plus, which we analyzed, we analyzed also for PVDEs. Performed the halogen screening with the GCECD and uh, for the purpose of um, a better understanding of the HBCDD congeners, we used LCMS to detect the HBCD because only with LCMS you are able to divide the uh, different isomers of HBCD. So what do we performed for the sample preparation? The sample materials was weighed into 50 milliliters centrifuge cubes together with 10 milliliters toluene. It has to be a distilled quality. The extraction was carried out for 15 hours. It's not um, a question of one hour more or less. An orbital shaker and after centrifugation for 10 minutes, an aliquot of one milliliter of the supernatant is taken out and transferred into a 10 milliliter flask and filled this flask was beforehand filled with eight milliliters and hexane pesticide grade. So to which the toluene extract was added dropwise, and what you get is a precipitation of the salt polymers. Um, the samples were not completely clean. There was some debris on it, so um, we have some additional step. I will mention it later. So the flask is then filled completely with anhexane to the mark and uh, uh, the whole toluene anhexane mixture was uh, filtrated through syringe filters. Um, then an aliquot was given to LCMS. And the rest of the extract uh, underwent the cleanup by adding one gram of sulfuric acid impregnated silica gel. This works fine for the investigated substances, but you always have to check if your substances are stable enough um, to survive this treatment. Um, we added uh, internal standard substances after this step. Um, it's uh, extremely cost intensive uh, to add it uh, to a, let's say, uh, this, uh, certain C labeled uh, substances before the analytical uh, work begins. It's possible, and for uh, some, some method development, it's necessary, but it's not uh, applicable as a standard uh, to edit. Um, before the extraction. Yeah, the used GCMS method was based on the uh, method Natsuko uh, presented today. Um, we relied in this case on the quantification on, on isotope leveled internal standard substance, substances and for a check, we also used external calibration. This may help also to, to give you an overview on the recovery of your substances. For the determination of uh, tetrabromobisphenol um, A and other brominated flame retardants, we uh, gave an adequate to the GCECD. 
Um, and it's important for us, uh, for me to note that the GCECD is also a control mechanism to see if we have seen all relevant brominated substances. So the GCECD is also a kind of a, of a screening uh, method. In this case, we used external calibration for quanti quantification. So um, some example, the decoran and the anti decoran added to the uh, method from uh, Japan. Um, if you are a little bit, um, you, you, you won't find the, um, the peak forms uh, really fine, but um, this is a scan, so um, you keep in mind that normally we use it in in this MID modus, and then we have more data points for for our peaks. But I would say it looks fine, and um, you can see that uh, if you are in the range of the limit of detection, which is uh, somewhere at. 10 to 50 ppb, um, the peaks are also acceptable. So this is what you see now is uh, uh, centered. Um, we have this group of, of um, POPs which are of interest and we decided to add some UV stabilizers. Um, to be honest, we analyzed UV stabilizers for the last uh, 30 years. Um, but uh, normally, the situation is that we do not talk about mixed plastics. In most cases, we analyze it in polystyrene or polyolefins or also PVC. So um, it's uh, new for us, or it was new for us to um, to analyze this um, stabilizers uh, with in mixed plastics. Um, and uh, with a UNEP GF um, POPS Global Monitoring Plan project, we are currently uh, developing or um, a method uh, integrating the UV328. Um, into a multi uh, method, which also contains the decorane and the PBDEs. This is, to be honest, work on progress. Um, uh, what you see now is a EV, UV328 uh, standard solution and sample. And what you see here is uh, the respective on a respective sample. So you can see it works. Um, you have typical uh, mass spec trend. Um, we are optimistic to reach uh, detection limits uh, between 10 to 40 ppbs um, in, in the samples. <clears throat> what we done is to be uh, clear, we made some modification. We use a 50 meter DB5 HD, co HD column. Uh, the background to this is that uh, the five um, meter column, uh, which is used by the Japanese method, has an advantage to be very fast and it works very well. Um, but um, if you want to go back to a multi method you need some in some cases you need some uh, uh, better separation another point is that if you use a five meter column um, there's a variation between uh, ECD and uh, MS is very uh, large because on the MS you have vacuum on the end of the column on the ECD you have an uh, um, pressure of the environment. So it's uh, difficult to compare both uh, things, um, or it's more difficult than uh, if you use a 50 meter column. Um, we made st uh, stability tests and we found out that the sulfuric acid step is due to the limited stability 
density of the UV stabilizers is not applicable and we try to find a cheap uh, internal standard for the UV234. Um, no, the so UV234 uh, is, uh, is a cheap replacement for an internal standard. Uh, this is another commercially available um, UV stabilizer that can be used as an internal standard. Um, yeah, and the goal was reached. We could then you can include in a pop multi massive. First result shows that the approach was successful. Thank you. I think it, uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks. Uh, Ludwig. For, for the overview. Um, there are different uh, UV uh, stabilizers. Uh, so 328 is only uh, 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 one of it. Uh, and I have uh, seen uh, some chromatograms where, let's say, UV 328 uh, had uh, a, a quite a small uh, amount compared to, to, to others. Yeah. So what is your experience, um, especially of quantifying uh, the UV uh, 328? Um, so um, we are an institute that works on, especially on food contact materials. And um, so 234 is never found. So we can uh, use it as an internal standard. And the 308 is, um, let's say, not uh, the most used uh, um, UV stabilizer. You have a, a huge bunch of, of UV stabilizers which are used. It's really, it, it's difficult to 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 uh, really uh, check this out because uh, um, uh, if you look on uh, on on the names, uh, brand names, and so on, um, you have uh, dozens of producers. Uh, of of all kinds of UV stabilizers, it, it's easy. So, so the UV two three four is similar to a Tinovin two three four and so on, but not it's not always um, such clear, and um, um, it's not really um, um, even we analyze hundreds or thousands of samples every year and. Uh, we have no idea about the presence of, of this UV stabilizers. Um, the only thing I can tell is that uh, um, so, uh, three, so eight, um, is not the most present uh, stabilizer. Uh, but you know, we will come to the topic now. This is as a, the listed pop, yeah. And so, yeah. therefore, finally, this will be globally regulated. So, at one point, there will be uh, regulatory limits, and uh, then uh, the question is: okay, it needs to be quantified, yeah. So we know it yeah. is uh, in 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 vehicles or, uh, and and also in, in in electronics. So the question is: um, when you have other uh, or the experience about the, the large amount of other UV stabilizers, uh, I would be interested uh, if, if this kind of uh, cross contamination or, or quantifying of the 328 uh, among, uh, if it has a, a quite small amount, yeah, if this is a challenge or uh, that you have optimized already a method where the 328 uh, is let's say, uh, uh, clearly separated from other uh, UV uh, stabilizers. It, it can be clear. Um, so uh, it might be a misunderstanding. As a, the quantification is, uh, of uh, 328 is not a problem at all, because they are all separated by chromatographic means. So the problem for, for me, uh, I was talking about was uh, 
knowing what kind of UV stabilizers are used as a general uh, um, measure. It's completely uh, uh, unknown to us how much um, um, products are um, produced with the 328 and how much are produced with others. You, if you need some UV stabilizers, if you talk about, let's say, poly, uh, styrene, poly olefins, uh, poly, uh, polyesters, this, you, you can assume that almost every product has some UV stabilization if it's in contact with the sun, the sunlight. So, uh, and the main problem for us uh, is not uh, quantifying it. Uh, it. It will work also with simple means with GCFID. So, because we talk about concentrations from 0 0.2 to 3 or 4 percent, of the stabilizer. So it's not uh, a, an analytical problem. Um, if you have, that's a problem might be um, um, to find which analysis has to be, anal uh, which samples ha has to be analyzed. And uh, a next problem would be a separation of these pro products from others, because there's not a, a simple XRF method uh, which tells you there's a promine there, and this promine indicates UV328. No, you have no uh, uh, indications. And also optical tests are not very helpful, though, because uh, they are very similar to so UV stabilizers. So um, I don't expect a, a, a fast testing method uh, somewhere um, at the origin of the waste. So you, it's simple to analyze it by analytical means, by chromatography, GCFID. It's absolutely not, not a problem, but it's not easy to, to perform uh, fast tests uh, or screening at, without your instrumentation. Uh, that's uh, maybe a, a big issue. And, then you run into the problem that you have not so much ideas about uh, when do companies use the uh, uh, 234 or the 328 or something like uh, that. Um, and this might be really a problem. And if you are not able to distinguish uh, the materials and you, you force a separation of the material, um, the EU, EU action plan for recycling um, is um, almost impossible to fulfill. So you, you, you need a testing mechanism where you maybe you are able to destroy it during some uh, processes if you um, process your materials. But uh, it's really a, a big question from, from, from our side. Uh, how should this work? Because you have no distinguishing in, uh, means for, between the 238 or, and the other UV stabilizers. And um, so if you force a uh, force, uh, 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 separation of this uh, material, so I think it will be forbidden uh, in foreseeable times. So, but uh, you have a lifetime of your products. Um, plastic materials are not always packaging, so um, you have to keep in mind that some products have a life a cycle of ten or twenty years. So it's uh, it's really a complicated issue from uh, from uh, from a practicability view, I think. That's my personal look. Yeah, and I think what we need now is really, let's say, more data. So uh, our screening of, of the plastic pellets from recycling, uh, including the, the UV 328 and uh, also Dechloran Plus, uh, gives hopefully a good insight uh, what we have at the moment uh, in, the, in the recycling uh, uh, cycles. I know also that in India, in the National Laboratory Neri, the UV stabilizer analysis have been established 
they screened food contact material and found uh, many UV stabilizers, for example, in milk pouches. So there, it seems uh, a, a larger issue, at least uh, in, in, in India, maybe other developing countries. So uh, looking forward uh, to the first uh, results from our study uh, in your laboratory on, on the UV stabilizers in recycling pellets. Yep. Um, good. Then we come to my last presentation on instrumental analysis. And um, I had uh, in the last webinar on 19th May uh, introduction uh, into the Stockholm uh, Convention draft guidance on sampling uh, screening of uh, POPs uh, in products and recycling. And uh, now here comes uh, the second part. In the first part, I already had introduced to the five-step approach of the monitoring guidance. Here, uh, step one, survey of products and recycling streams, which are uh, compiled in Annex 1 of the guidance. Then uh, step two, uh, sample collection and uh, screening, uh, pre-screening uh, in the field and in laboratory, which uh, just Mr. Gruber highlighted uh, of much uh, uh, relevance. When, it, when we come to, to recycling and circular economy. And uh, today I would like to tell about step four, the quantification and what kind of information the guidance uh, is providing uh, for that. So the guidance includes for main mat matrices, technical information on extraction and cleanup of samples and information on sample preparation. Here, this is an example uh, from uh, chapter four, which is about the, the prominated uh, flame retardants. So here you see uh, we have one part about preparation of polymer and plastic samples. So here also the Fraunhofer Institute have supported. So we have a part of their methodology included here. Then extraction uh, from plastics, extraction from textiles or from polyurethane foam. Also, this information is uh, from the experiences uh, from the from the Fraunhofer um, institution. So uh, yesterday, uh, Dr. Gruber said that uh, there is not really uh, publications on their methods, but we have at least uh, some key information in our guidance documents. Some preparations need to be adjusted and optimized to complex materials like plastic. So that was a big part of the presentation yesterday from Dr. Gruber. And care has to be taken that the polymer do not contaminate the instrument. Yeah, also this uh, was highlighted and uh, explained in detail uh, yesterday. And I recommend you on that topic to have a look to our recorded um, webinar. So the guidance uh, contain for individual POPs section on uh, quantification and sometimes semi-quantification of methods. Also here, uh, example for the prominated flame retardants. So here about measurements of PBDEs um, and uh, instrumental analysis of PBDEs and hexabromobiphenyl, examples of a GCMS setting uh, are included. And we normally have always a section on international and national standards for analysis of uh, the individual uh, POPs and where available, uh, including uh, standards uh, for uh, products and recycling. Uh, the same here, instrumental analysis for hexabromocyclododecan uh, with uh, then the setting of LCMS and also here international standards for HBCD analysis. So this is given for the different uh, POPs in products uh, included uh, in the guidance. Then one approach of the guidance is to refer to international standards. So here an example for short chain chlorinated uh, paraffins in products. So here there are uh, some ISO standards. One is on determination of uh, chlorinated hydrocarbons in leather. Then 
um, another one on, on textiles. And uh, currently an ISO standard is developed uh, for SCCP and MCCP uh, in textiles. Then we have also included um, other uh, international standards for other materials, which can be relevant for POPs in products uh, here, uh, uh, ISO standard for, for sewage sludge and, and, and biosolids, uh, and also the international standard uh, for, for water, because it's also a product. So for a number of product matrices, no international standards are available for sampling extraction and cleanup. So here for those where available, some in-house methodologies used by laboratories experienced in the analysis of uh, individual pops in products and recycling are described. Yeah, so this means the, the laboratory method of Fraunhofer, which I said is uh, included here for the, for the brominated flame retardants in plastic, is not an international standard. That's an in-house in uh, methodology, uh, but uh, it is uh, evaluated and used for more than a, a decade and therefore can be considered uh, uh, reliable. Also, the guidance uh, in Annex 2 uh, describes case studies with references to uh, some reports where monitoring or analytical procedures for pop in certain products and matrices is described uh, for further for further reading. And then there is a, a large Annex 3, which contain for each of the pop a full analytical method for instrumental analysis. So for example, here, when uh, you look to the brominated pop, we have uh, one annex on the GC MS analysis of PBDEs. Uh, we have another method on the GC ECD analysis. So this means both methods which were introduced today, they are also uh, in, the, in, in the guidance um, included. Um, we have also for hexabromobiphenyl listed as a pop, but not really relevant because of the small production volume uh, instrumental analysis. And here for hexabromocyclododecan, we have it also included in the GCECD analysis, as uh, Dr. Kashiwara already uh, mentioned, that this is uh, possible when we are not interested in the, in the different isomers of uh, HBCD. And we have a method here on the LCMS analysis of HBCD, uh, where also then the different isomers uh, can be found. And uh, for all these uh, different uh, analyses, we have the full instrumental setting uh, for each of the POPs. So here, this is an example for the, for the PBDE analysis and the complete uh, instrumental setting. Um, there are suggestions of temperature programs, which are robust temperature programs. So many of those uh, we have uh, from uh, Shimatsu Techno, which is one of the best uh, uh, laboratories uh, participating in the in the UN uh, round uh, robin studies, but also we have methods from Fraunhofer and, uh, for example, from um, Dr. Kashiwara from Nice. Also, options on the GCMS columns are included. So here for the PBDEs, the suggestion is here the 15 meter column. But uh, as uh, Dr. Kashiwara showed in her presentation, also a five meter column uh, is, is possible to, to minimize cost. And also this uh, five meter approach we have included and we have made the, the reference to the study of uh, the, the Japanese uh, National Laboratory. Um, also, we have included for all different analysis, the full masses for the individual POPs. Uh, including high resolution aspect uh, so here you see the all the masses for the for the PVDEs uh, for the high resolution GCMS and of course you can use these masses also for the low resolution uh, GCMS you just uh, do not uh, cannot uh, include all these these digits uh, also uh, these uh, mass um, masses include masses of of carbon 13 standards uh, and of other standards. So by this, uh, you can set up uh, your instrument uh, for the individual uh, for the individual pops. Also, 
uh, in the annex, we provide uh, GC chromatograms um, because I always found it very useful uh, to have a full uh, chromatograms, uh, which are also assigned for the different uh, congeners. So you see here the assigned uh, uh, illusion um, on a 15 meter column from the tetrabromodiphenyl ethers up to the decabromodiphenyl ether. Yeah, and here the, the, the retention time for, for, for that method. So uh, this I always have found uh, useful and therefore I included it in the, in the guidance. Um, another example here of a chromatogram um, for PCNs, which is also uh, has been used in products until 2000. Um, here we have included uh, chromatograms for the technical mixtures. So this you would expect uh, when you measure, for example, plastic cables uh, from 1930s to, to 1970s, or uh, these technical halowax mixtures were also used in, in, in rubber, in neoprene uh, rubber until two, 2000. Um, in, additionally, we have included here uh, the, the chromatogram uh, of uh, thermal and incineration of, of, of PCN pattern, um, which can then be uh, dis distinguished and be understood when you uh, uh, screen for a sample, if this comes from a technical mixture uh, or if it comes from a, from a thermal mixture. Also, we have included uh, methods for chlorinated paraffin analysis. So here we have included three analytical methods. Uh, we have included the low resolution uh, GC uh, EC uh, NI low resolution mass spectroscopy, which was introduced uh, today uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, Sprengel. So, like uh, he emphasized, so this can be uh, used also for developing countries. And we have one uh, uh, member here, uh, Iago Guida from, from Brazil, uh, which have uh, developed. Uh, this method then in, in his laboratory uh, in, 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 in Brazil. So uh, such transfer is, uh, is possible because many uh, laboratories or a range of laboratories in, in, in developing countries have this low resolution mass spectroscopy spectrometers. Then we have included the LCMS MS method from the National Institute uh, for Environmental uh, Studies, uh, which uh, uh, was introduced also today in the uh, by uh, Dr. Matsukami, and in addition, we have uh, also described there a GC high resolution MS method um, with the orbit, uh, which is let's say a, a high end method, which not many laboratories have, but many laboratories which are analyzing uh, uh, chlorinated paraffins are using uh, this orbit trap. Uh, um, method because of the of the potential of the of the resolution of this method. Also, we have uh, included uh, for pop p phases uh, three analytical methods here in 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 the annex. So two methods for uh, LCMS MS uh, and one method uh, provided by the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology IST. Uh, in Japan, this is according to the uh, um, ISO uh, method, and they also have uh, provided here chromatograms uh, for the main uh, uh, PFASs, um, which then can be assessed and compared. Also, we have included one GCMS uh, method, because in developing countries, yes, many laboratories does not have LCMSMS. Uh, and um, in a PhD uh, in Germany of a Kenyan uh, researcher. Uh, now uh, he is professor in, in Kenya, uh, Professor Francis Orata. So he developed a GCMS uh, method and also that this method we have uh, included in the annex of the Stockholm Convention guidance document. Um, PFAS, um, including POP PFAS is uh, quite complicated analysis, especially when you consider that there are the uh, P4R-related substances, which uh, for P4R are more than 200 uh, P4R-related uh, substances. So here, 
it is a, a real challenge because for most of these uh, P4R related substances, we do not have um, standards. Yeah, also this, let's say, is described uh, in, in, in the guidance on the challenges. Uh, and one solution is uh, the total uh, oxidized uh, oxidized uh, precursor assay, uh, which was introduced uh, yesterday by Professor Chin Huang, uh, which at least can degrade a large share of the P4 or PFOS uh, related precursor then uh, for, for a quantification. And also this is, let's say, shortly referred to in the guidance document. So, um, what information uh, need to be added uh, in the guidance? So this guidance is uh, from uh, the last update we did in 2021. So therefore, uh, as a next update of the guidance, uh, we need to include the new listed POPs, uh, the UV328 uh, and the Declaran Plus. So this uh, has not been uh, done yet. Um, also, um, over the last two years, there were more uh, useful case studies. And as I mentioned in the first presentation, the first part, uh, we have uh, in Annex 2 uh, a compilation of, of, of uh, best practice uh, case studies. So also this uh, will uh, be updated then for the, for the next version. And for the next version, new international uh, standards, uh, especially ISO standards or SEN standards, for the analysis of, of POPs, I mentioned that uh, in 2021, the, the standard uh, for uh, short and medium chain chlorinated paraffins were under uh, development. So this will be then also included in the in next update. But uh, please uh, download the guidance. Uh, it's on the, the website. And I will uh, afterwards share the link uh, of the Stockholm Convention website where you can find uh, the guidance and give some guidance to find it because it's not that easy uh, to find um, the guidance document. Good. Um, we check if we have, uh, do we have any question directly to the, to the presentation? No questions just yet, just the comments that this was very useful. Okay, yes, thanks. If we do not have at the moment questions, then um, we can uh, directly continue with uh, our next uh, presenter. Uh, that's um, Dr. Peter Benisch from uh, Biodetection uh, System in um, Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands. Uh, with uh, Dr. Benish, I made together uh, more than 25 years ago together PhD. And uh, since then, uh, yes, we have uh, a cooperation. He is also uh, included uh, in the monitoring study of um, POPs uh, in, 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 in recycled uh, pellets. And um, Peter, you can start your presentation and your slides. Hello, Roland. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you see my slides a moment? Yes, I see it. And now the remote. So I hope you can see now my slides, right? Yes. yes. Can you also hear me well? Yes, we hear you well. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Roland, for the introduction. And it's, of course, a big pleasure to be also with you here all. And uh, we are very pleased that we also have a chance to talk about toxicity and about bioanalysis for POPs and EDCs. As Roland mentioned already, since 30 years, we are involved in many of these POPs and endocrine disrupting chemicals. And I will show you a little bit today how we are doing this in these days. So you can see on the first page that, of course, we, we do a lot of plastic testing uh, for these plastic additives and, uh, and other pollutants in the plastic. And we use this time uh, human cells and we are using high throughput out robotic as you can see on the page on the right side below. Now, as we have seen the last two, uh, four days of this uh, international meeting here, there's a lot of public concern about those plastic additives. Uh, there are many different plastics 
And I will talk a bit, little bit about known and unknown chemicals as we have seen in several presentations. I give you some insights into toxicological profiling of plastic additives. I will also talk about industrial innovations and developments we are, we are uh, participating and uh, some EU projects for safer plastic. And as Roland mentioned already, I will give you some first insights about the plastic pellets from Nigeria we were testing the last two or three weeks. Now, as you can see here, of course, there's a lot of concern about plastic. And as you can see here, feminized boys, plastic baby bottles, harmful. These are all typical, um, typical issues the last 20 years about these endocrine disrupting chemicals. And bisphenol A was always in the middle point of these discussions. And in these days, of course, bisphenol A have been often substituted with other chemicals, which have maybe the same, the same harm than BPA. And therefore, it's important uh, if you control also the substituates of uh, the known pollutants. And of course, as we have seen in this EPCP uh, presentation and meetings the last uh, few days, there are many chemicals used in the plastic device and they are very diverse and often complex. Uh, the chemical analysis we have seen is quite costly, challenging, and of course, animal testing cannot be done. So of course, there, there is a need for using non-animal testing, also covering the known and the unknown chemicals. And as we have seen also in the last presentation from Roland, there is a lack of uh, harmonized regulation for such bioassays, because this I was of course missing in the presentation before, and we need more uh, support for also establishing bioassay guidelines. And as we have seen the last few days, uh, of course, there are, uh, plastics is, of course, uh, there is paperboard, metal coding, printing links, additives, and so on and so on. And we believe that uh, we only cover at the moment by chemical analysis the EIS, the intent intentionally added substances with monomers additives. But we believe that there are much more non intended, intended uh, substances like for example, for example, impurities, degradation products, oligomers, and so on. We have seen the last few days, several of these examples here, are just five other examples of additives, UV uh, compound we have just talked about and learned from Mr. Gruber and Roland Weber. And so there are many of those compounds. And if you look at the bisphenol A case, uh, if you if you make an action, you, you say it's not good to have bisphenol A, then of course the chemical industry comes with other bisphenol A, der bisphenol A derivatives, and I will show a few of them. And the question is, how safe are they? So how, how good is the regrettable substitution in these days? And it's very complex because you have printed color contaminants and so on. Now, in, in case of the food contact chemicals, we, we have noticed this, and there have been in the last five years, many publications about that, that we need also toxicity testing because we have only some data of the EAS and uh, of the NIAS, we don't have many informations regarding in vitro toxicity profiling. So there's certainly need to improve that. Um, and we need also risk assessment for these unknown chemicals. Um, and we all believe that the modernized tiered approach for screening is really necessary or needed. Also, that we, we really miss the addressing of mixture toxicity. And especially in endocrine disruption, we hope, of course, that uh, the in vitro testing, which was which was integrated in the in the bio -C testing it will also now be used for plastic testing. Now in this bio -C guideline, uh, there have been mentioned uh, the female hormone testing, this is the estrogens, and uh, the male hormones, this is the androgens, the thyroid, and the steroidogenesis. So these are typical basic tests for endocrine disruptive testing. And you see here in, in level two, it mentions in B2 assays, um, so we are focusing on that. So we are the company who uses this ARRT receptor binding affinity uh, or ARRT uh, transcription activation bioassays in, in a high throughput by mode. And also the H receptor is also one of those you mentioned. So how we do this, we use human cell-based technology. And basically, if you have, if a benzoapyrene or, or a, BPA is entering a cell line, then it, 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 it leads, it goes through the cell membrane and then it binds on some protein. And this is leading then to uh, going into the cell, cell nucleus and there is a chemical response element. And this leads to an uh, enzyme activation. And if you have a stable transfected cell line, 
uh, then you have basically a, a luciferin, a luciferase activation, and if you add luciferin, you have light. And it's quite a simple calculation. It's just uh, if you have one nanogram uh, BPA in in a, in a sample, and it it has a light unit of one thousand, and you use then one gram of plastic, and it has also one thousand relative lightness, then you have one nanogram BPA equivalent per gram plastic material. Now in these days, of course, we are we are using high throughput testing for that. As you can see here, this is the Hamilton Star Lab. So you just put a 384 well blade or a 96 well blade, and there is always on the on the blade is the standard like uh, benzoapyrene or dioxins or P4 or whatever you like, and then you put an extract of one gram plastic into the 96 well blade, and then you can measure that. Uh, and here it is also instrumental analysis. So basically, we use, we use a luminometer, which is a quite smaller machine than the machines have been described the last four days. It's a machine cost about 15,000 euro, 15 to 20,000 euro. And here in our high throughput laboratory, of course, we have also stacker, which is they're automatically um, adding the samples. So basically, we can do about 40 samples per hour for the quantitative analysis of the total amount of pollutants. For example, hormones, PFAS, dioxins, or pH in the sample. Now, these biases they are used since about 30 years in all kinds of different applications. So this is an old publication from about 15 years ago, where you see on the left side uh, the dirty dozen pops and additional pops. And on the top side, you see many of our biases. So for the female, male hormone, and so on. I don't want to go now more in detail in this. This is just to show you that the POPs have been, of course, also tested with the biases. And we know exactly which biases are, uh, are very important for which POPs. And therefore, we use usually a, a packet of biases to, uh, to measure the unknown and unknown POPs and EDCs in plastic material. And of course, the same we have done in 2006, so 17 years ago, also in a European project called FIRE, where we have tested many of these today mentioned, uh, often mentioned flame retardants. And there we have on the left side, you see the different flame retardants. On the top, you see our different Calox bioassays. And you can see here that the typical BDEs, 39, 99, and uh, 153, they are active in the in, in some of the hormones. And uh, very importantly, I would say, is really the thyroid hormone activation, like the TTR, uh, for example, tetrabrom bisphenol A, uh, and, and also for other PBDEs. So these are typical biocell, which we would, re would recommend also to use for uh, plastics who have influenced or who are influenced by uh, hominated flame retardants. Now there's also ISO standard uh, for using the estrogen calox, which is a for the female hormones. So here you see on the left side, many different chem chemicals like bisphenol A is active in this biosay, many phthalates, um, many other of the, of the bisphenol derivatives. And so these are relative potency factors and they can actually be used to calculate uh, estradiol equivalence from, that, from, the from the chemical concentration. And then you can also uh, quantify that. I will show you later some examples. Of course, also uh, internationally, there's a lot of activities regarding plastic additives. This is, for example, from the NIHS in the US. They, of course, use also such a panel of different bioassays. For example, you see here BPA has a full cocktail of different activities. So it's active in the, in the male hormone, female hormone. Uh, this is AR and IR. PPR means obesity testing. PXR is early warning. So it's a wide range of activities, for example, for bisphenol A. Um, and also uh, for other plastic additives. Of course, in European Union, we had also many projects. This is, for example, a European project called ChemScreen. In the ChemScreen project, the aim was uh, to test many of these plastic additives. You see here on the left side, many phthalates, anonyphenol, octiphenol, and different bisphenol R. And typically, they are active in the estrogen calyx and the anti alkyls and anti pia calyx. And this way, also the test used for the project uh, we are we are currently doing for the United Nations in this project, in this program. I will show you later. And of course, it was always, uh, especially in Netherlands, we had a big project where we were looking for substitutes from the known uh, plastic additives. And we found out that furan-based counterparts largely lack endocrine activities. And therefore, for example, FPTA is one of the plastics which we recommend to use because there we know there is not the typical uh, endocrine disrupting properties. 
And in the last two, three years, there were a couple of studies of Martin Wagner groups. Um, and as you can see here, he, he used different products and polymers, and he, he made mostly two different extractions with water methanol mixtures. And then the extract he put on different biases. On the right side, you can see that there were many different uh, bio-based, uh, petroleum-based, plant-based, uh, bio-based, non-biodegradable, typical plastic compounds, as we know, PLA, PBS, starch, cellulose, polyethylene samples. And this was published in Environment International uh, three years ago. And here, this is a typical heat map of toxicity testing. Don't be worried. I will not bring you to all the specific details. I think it's just important that you look on the right side because it just said that 43 everyday bio based products were tested by Vito Bioassays. 67% were active in the mycotox, which is a baseline toxicity. 42% did show oxidative distress, 23 anti androgenicity, and several of the tests uh, of the materials also showed cytotoxicity in estrogenicity. So here you see a typical bench of bioassays which can be used for such complex mixtures of polymers and, monom and plastic materials. Concerned, I think, was about this publication of him because, of course, if you look, he mentions here that about 41,000 chemical features with 186 to, to 21,000 features are present in the individual sample. 80% of the extract contained more than 1,000 features. And from this day, they know about 343 priority compounds. Uh, they could show that there's a strong relationship between in vitro toxicity and samples which have a lot of these chemical features. Therefore, we believe it's very important to use a combination of the chemical analysis and also the biological ultra trace effect based methods. And also uh, important is here that he mentions that the conventional plastic indicated bioplastic and plant based materials are similarly toxic. In a study earlier, he was uh, looking also for similar compounds. So, we, what we will show later uh, HDPE, LDPE, polystyrol, polypropylene, PET, PVC. And here he also found similar results than in the study, in the study I mentioned before. So you see oxidative distress, you see the inhibition of the male hormones, so anti-androgenicity, you see also estrogenicity in those materials. Um, and again, you see a lot of features and only some of them we can link to a chemical compound. And he mentions here that LTPE, PVC and PU induced most toxicological endpoints. And therefore we have also chosen in our first study following soon, uh, these and these uh, materials. The latest study was just two weeks ago, presented at the CTEC conference, where he used also many of our Calox reporter gene assays, also for pregnant X receptor, which is a kind of for early warning, then uh, PPR gamma, which is a kind of test for obesity, and then the estrogen receptor alpha and the androgen receptor are for the female and the male hormone, and here also so the six. Uh, 36 of 39 plastics have activated these bioassays. Here, the most active was the PXR with 36 of 39 acti uh, active plastics. The estrogen testing was 25 of 39. The obesity was 23 of 39. And uh, male hormone was 14 of 39. And this shows, of course, a third study from him that always these endocrine disrupting chemicals are important. So plastic additives are certainly something to consider. And also that the whole mixture of finished products needs a combination of chemical analysis and also bioassays. And uh, these results demonstrate that many chemicals are leaching out and more than we have known so far and which are covered by the chemical analysis as well. We are, of course, also involved in, in, in uh, with the, is the industry. This is a standard operation procedure of uh, Nestle and PPG, so big international companies. Uh, originally, this was, it was planned to be for all plastics, then later they specified it for metal packaging coatings. But I really believe that this SOP can be used for all kinds of plastics. So if you are interested to receive this SOP, I'm very pleased to send it to you. So basically, what we do here, we describe the extraction. Uh, or migration in this case, because it's with, with migration chambers here. And then the, the step for the chemical analysis and for the bioassay analysis. Uh, we also published last month this study 
where we made an interlaboratory study with four different chemical analysis laboratory. And uh, it was quite difficult for the chemical analysis to look at all the different peaks. Um, uh, so you can see here from three different chemical analysis laboratory, they found uh, 100, 109, and 41 peaks. And uh, from those, they did know 89, 72, and 3D8 uh, peaks of this um, bisphenol R coding and reference materials. Um, but it was quite difficult to get here a good um, results between all the different laboratories. The same samples were also tested by two different uh, biosa laboratories of BDS and Nestle itself for the AR alpha color, which is for female hormone activation. And the anti-air is for the inhibition of the female hormone. And then the AR color, which is for the male hormone. And the anti-R is for the inhibition of the male hormone. And you can see here that 44 out of 48 samples were in concordance. There was only one, basically one test coding, which there was a dis difference between the anti ir calox result of our laboratory and Neste. And this basically came because here different cytotoxicity tests were used. Um, so therefore, we believe these are very good results for two different biosa laboratories covering such bisphenol R compounds. We are also involved with some other industrial partners. It's one of our publications with Axo Nobel. So here was, of course, how can we substitute bisphenol A, as you can see here. So the idea was to move from pet petroleum-derived uh, DOs like BPA to cellulosic biomass alternatives. And if you look here, for example, in the table one, endocrine activity of asymmetric foranic DOs versus bisphenol A, you see the, the structure 5A, which had, did have no activity and the AR calox for female hormone activation and the AR calox in the anti r and anti tr calox. This is, of course, very good. So we, we, we know compounds which don't have bisphenol R specific activity and we can substitute it. We are also involved in the PFAS uh, story. As in the last presentation, we have seen that this is also an important issue. So this is one of the publications uh, with IPEN and Arnica, which we have done last year. So it's about throwaway packaging for ever chemicals. It was a European-wide survey of PFAS in disposable food package and tableware. So here were some packaging material from uh, KFC, as you can see here in the first line, and from McDonald's and from others in Europe. And it was analyzed by the TOF assay, then also by chemical analysis for 102 PFAS compounds. And we also measured in it a, a TTR feeds to fear bioassay, and we could find here in those uh, also activities. Uh, I also tried afterwards to have a correlation between the different methods, but as you can mention, these are quite different endpoints. One with the TOF assay is analyzing total organic fluoride, then the chemical analysis is some specific congeners, and even if have, we have tested 102 PFAS here, there are many thousands more. So it's of course different because the bioassay will measure the known and the unknown one, uh, so in this case, I did not see good correlation between the three different analysis methods, but so we need certainly more correlation between uh, such sophisticated um, and uh, good, bio good uh, technologies to analyze the, some of the thousands of PFAS. Since many years, we are also, of course, involved in the dioxin analysis. This is a study from 2018 with Arnica with the, uh, dioxins in plastic toils. So here we are. Uh, from many different countries where samples sampled from the different NGOs here involved. And you see on the type, there were different ones, toy cars, hair diadem, cubes, toy revolvers, and so on. So many of those are consumer products or toys for children. And at first it was screened for um, total organic bromine and uh, suspect samples here about 25%. They were also less tested for PBDEs. You see this here in the table. Uh, the PPD concentrations, and then afterwards also analyzed by the DEA calox. And um, after we have seen that there are very high activities in our DEA calox for dioxin, dioxin like compounds, they were also sent to a chemical analysis lot of, uh, laboratory, MRS in Germany, and they confirmed the high level. So if you see here, the PBDF, the T cupergram is high resolution chemical analysis, and the DEA calox is bioanalysis. And you see here, uh, quite similar results in 
several samples with high levels and some others with lower levels. Now I would like to come to the last study, which was introduced from Roland Weber, which is in cooperation with NIS and also with the Fraunhofer Institute. So we had a couple of meetings the last few weeks that we decided that we would like to, uh, to start at first with four different uh, plastic materials or rusic lads from plastic. And uh, we use here three different kinds of extraction methods. One is with THF hexane. We used always 0.5 gram material, and then we we shaked it, um, and afterwards we put it in 5D micolor DMSO for the biomassa analysis. The second method is 50% ethanol water um, shaking, um, uh, and then in an oven at 60 degree, degree for three days. Um, and the third method is 20% uh, ethanol water uh, for one day at 40 degree. So the first is a full extraction. We can say that most of people, uh, most of uh, compounds will come in. Out here, the second one is a little bit like uh, food contact testing, and the third one is a little bit like skin contact testing. That's why we have used these three different methods. Now, these are the first results. So the first sample was a high-density polyethylene HDPE sample from Nigeria. Um, it was the pellet origin was from the national feedstock. It was used in water tanks. And there were also some additives in the master batch. It was a black colored pellet. And this pellet is usually used for cherry can, grease container, and spoons. Um, and as you can see here, uh, it was a black material. And if you extract it, uh, it was actually a clear liquid, what you can see on that photo here. Um, and uh, now we have used one time the extraction TIF meta, so the first method and the extraction with 50% ethanol. And we have used the cytotox color, so cell deaths, then the male hormone activation uh, or inhibition, in this case, anti-androgens, then genotoxicity, DNA repair, P53 color, the female hormone activation, and PIHs. And if you could, you see in both uh, extraction method that we find some cell deaths, uh, luckily we don't find uh, hormone activity here in, in that uh, sample but we find quite high levels in PIHs, so uh, between 2,000 and 7,000 nanogram benzoapyrene equivalents per gram material. Now let's compare this to the other materials. So the second material was a LDPE, so low density polyethylene. You see it had different colors. It was mixed colors of green, white, and yellow, where we extracted with THF and 50% ethanol. And you can see uh, this glass vial, the second photo here on the left side, which is a little bit a yellow liquid. Um, here in this case, um, you see lower amounts of PIHs. You again see that most of the hormones are not active, only in the 50% ethanol. You have 14 nicogram flutamide equivalent per gram material. Um, and both have a, the, the th THF hexane has a higher pseudotoxicity than the 50% ethanol. Now let's move to the next sample, which was a PVC sample. Um, it was uh, usually used for sanders or footwear and uh, or from pellet feedstock material was sanders and footwear. It was a black material and the pellet should be used or was planned to be used for slippers and carpets. So you can see on the first photo on the left side, it's a black material. And here in this case, if you extract this TF, THF hexane, you have a very black uh, material. Um, so therefore you find here much higher levels of PIHs. You can see that, uh, especially in the TF hexane extraction, because you really, uh, you also, um, I would say you also destroy a little bit uh, the polymer and you get here PIH like compounds out. So 45,000 nanogram B, BIP levels per gram material is a quite high level. You also see in the anti-androgens a quite high activity compared to the, from the TF hexane extraction compared to the 20% ethanol for skin. In this case, we used uh, the extraction for skin uh, because this material was used for slippers and therefore we have chosen this extraction method as a comparison. And now the last sample, which was a polypropylene sample, um, it was, coming from toys, jars, cup pellets. Um, it's a white and pink colored polymer here. 
and the pollet was used was planned to used for pellets, plastic bottles, and beverage cup. In this case, you see um, only cytotoxicity and the THF hexane extraction. You see also the glass vial; it's quite visible. Um, so this is of course easy to test for such bioassays. Uh, you see the anti androgens are have the same concentrations, and and the PIHs are also quite high, uh, but less than the PVC sample. So now my last take or my take home message, yeah, for a safer and sustainable approach of complex mixtures of known and unknown chemicals in plastic and bioplastics, we believe that there's a need to be monitored by a combined chemical and effect-based biological toxicity screening test following such tests, what I have shown today, which are based on OECD guidelines, TG455, 458, and also ISO standard 190-4, uh, and um, also um, ISO 24295. Um, so, for having a safe design and green chemistry using in vitro toxicity is, is already in many R&D applications for all kinds of plastic materials used, but international regula regulatory framework is still missing. So we hope here that you can help and support us with that in the future. And I hoped that I that we could show today that such high throughput biases are used already decades for chemicals testing. So the question is why not using also for safer bioplastic testing following industrial leaders. So I hope that I could show you a little bit the fascination of effect-based ultra trace analysis. And thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm open, of course, for your questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Um, I also think that for these kind of uh, uh, complex uh, mixtures of the non-intentionally added substances, and uh, also uh, of mixtures of, of, of additives that um, more than the individual instrumental analysis is needed, uh, but also toxicity tests. So uh, the samples which we selected, uh, we, we checked uh, which one of those samples are used in, in food contact materials and uh, which are especially used uh, in, in skin contact materials like uh, the sandals. And, um, then uh, for those samples, we decided to do also uh, this, this bioassay. So you mentioned uh, Nestle as one example uh, of using uh, bioassays for their product testing. Um, do you know if, if other industries, uh, plastic industries, are also doing this? And, and uh, how, let's say, in, in, in what kind of dimension this is, this is done by the, by the larger industry? Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Roland. This is a very, very important question. As you can imagine, as, as long as the, in the, the, the government is not really pushing the industry, so they do it mostly in their research development. So, of course, the most of the feed and food, uh, the, the, the most of the multi international companies, I have to say, they have, of course, also in house early, early warning systems. So, they are looking at the literature and case studies, and then they follow where there is some public concern for consumers. In this case, they they take this uh, these methods also serious, but of course, there are still large large monitoring is not in place. And uh, for from the government side, uh, do you see that uh, governments are using uh, such bioassays? I mean, for what kind of uh, uh, products? Uh, so, do they also screen here uh, plastics on toxicity? Um, so the, those biases, they're, they're, since 30 years, they are developed, but they are mostly used for chemicals testing, which are, have endocrine disrupting properties or for uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, chemicals, and, and but not so far much for, um, for plastics. So there's really some urgent need to make that more clear that the added value of the biases is really to cover the ERs and the NEAs. And also this example, what we have shown here, shows, of course, some urgent concern also for PHs. Um, but from from regulatory perspective, um, is there any regulation which uh, limits for for chemicals uh, endocrine effects or or genotoxicity where these bioassays are are used? I mean, first uh, generally on chemicals, and the second then if there are any examples on 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 plastics or plastic related assessment. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. Uh, we are also missing that for the, for plastics, um, but of course there are many. I, I showed today many publications which show, of course, the aim from the industry to screen 
candidates, you know, to be bisphenol A free, you know, or have less toxicity than bisphenol A or phthalate. So of course there is there's of course in the R and D towers in the industries of course some concern about these toxic effects for for plastic additives. But still, I'm to answer your question. I'm also missing that more uh, plastics materials are tested, and I hope that of course the study of Martin Wagner and ours also ours. And the opportunity which to, which you gave us today to show that here on a, uh, on a United Nations levels also uh, increases the, the the you know the the fascination of these biosense and also again it's very important to, to have a safer plastic in the future and I hope that also many other countries follow this Green Deal strategy but we are now starting in Europe and for this you need to touch biosense yeah. yeah. Now, now we have used uh, or selected for our study uh, five essays. Yeah, um, can you let's say uh, explain a bit why you have selected those essays? And uh, uh, because also our project was let's say quite time limited, uh, what other essays uh, you would recommend uh, to use to screen toxicity uh, from plastics? So why did we select those? Why are they especially relevant and what others uh, would be uh, relevant in your opinion? Yeah, thank you very much for this important question. Indeed, so we have different biases. We have one because we use a human cell line. So it's, of course, for us important is the cell death important. Can the cell line repair itself? So genotoxicity effect. Those both we have used as general toxicity tests. And then we used, of course, as we have seen in my presentation, a lot of phthalates and uh, bisphenol A are active in the female hormone and in the inhibition of the male hormone. And we know that, of course, PRH-like compounds are really thousands of compounds. And at the moment, I think there are only a few PRHs regulated. Uh, so this was the reason why we have to choose this five, but basically it was because we had a limited budget. You know, and of course, there are many. Your second question was, which other bios could be used for that? So as I showed in my presentation, uh, I think, of course, still dioxins could be important in case of high PBD uh, concentration, because you can have prominent dioxins. Of course, PFAS, which is a TTRT, um, which this bioassay is also actually uh, active for the chlorinated paraffin. So I think this is also the thyroid hormone should maybe also added in, in future testing. And I think also many people are concerned about obesity. So we have different tests, uh, PPI alpha and PPI gamma, gamma for, for these testings. Uh, the other thing is, of course, early warning, which is PXR and oxidative stress. So I would say these five biases, they are not yet in this first screening here, because just as you mentioned, because of uh, lack in time, we had only one month's time for that and also lack in budget. So, of course, thank you very much for this question. And I hope that we have a second round and then we can add also these biases. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you have also seen in our presentations that we took care uh, to have, uh, let's say, in addition to sophisticated method, also methods which can be established uh, in developing countries. And uh, now in respect to, to, to the bioassays, how do you see the potential of uh, developing countries uh, to establish uh, uh, such uh, methods? How complicated is it to establish uh, such, such method? And um, yeah, what, what kind of uh, in investment uh, is would be needed yeah thank you very much it's a very important question of course we developed this test system as screening tool uh, and of course in some markets like dioxin testing for feed and food it's internationally a, a dominating player because of course the costs are what well, half of it at least from the chemical analysis uh, so usually th this is a very simple method you know you as i showed you have just aluminometer which is your most expensive machine cost about 15 to twenty thousand euro um and the, the, the standard cost for reagents material, I would say, is below 20 euro per sample. So these are, of course, low cost. You can do, as I showed, high, high throughput art screening. Um, yeah. I'm also wondering why more people in, in several countries or in developing countries use such screening tests. Because the thing is, if the bioassay is negative, then you don't have to be concerned about many thousands of unknown, unknown chemicals. Yeah, but uh, let's say what is what is a precondition? What kind of laboratory can establish such such uh, typical, such bioassays? Yeah, that's a good question. These are typical normal microbiology laboratories. You know, they 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 know how to handle ecotoxicity testing or you know microbiology testing. You know, E. coli, Salmonella, whatever. This this typical 
things. They they have they they know how to work. Uh, st uh, hygienic working. You need you need a flow bench uh, for sterile working. You need a, a liquid nitrogen tank to keep the cells. Um, a microscope. So it's very simple machines in most of them. The advantages of this te test system is really, I would say, you you can learn about in in two to three weeks. You can easily learn those bioassays. Do you have experience uh, to develop capacity uh, in developing countries for such uh, bioassays? Um, yeah, of course. The, the, I mean, the dioxin calox, of course, is, is used in, in many countries, of course. Um, so for the polypromenade dioxins and so on. Uh, in case of the hormone testing, yeah, this is a good... I mean, what, what countries have developed the, the, the dioxin bioassay or, or laboratories? Yeah, for example, Brazil, of course, Chile, uh, China, Russia, many many uh, countries have established this test. So this the this luminometer based technology is there, and and the good thing is of this bio say if you have one time the luminometer and the other lab equipment, you can easily jump like in the mass spectrometer. You do today dioxins, tomorrow PFAS, on the next day you do MCCP, LCCP because it's always the same equipment. But I also have to say that the microbiology testing was never there. Now we have the opportunities. We have this one easy technology, this one machine, this one lab equipment. We can do all that different kind of pollutants. This is maybe, in my opinion, the microbiology did, did that uh, do not so in, in the last 30 years. So we are one of the few which really pushing to use uh, or, or to show the advantage of using such easy technologies uh, and where you can cover a wide range of uh, really pollutants, as you have shown you last four, four days, uh, Roland, uh, it gets, of course, more and more complicated uh, because we still have only, you know, do whatever, 100 PFAS from the 10,000, or we do only 29 dioxins and PCBs from the 30,000 polyhalogenate and so on. So if you, the list of the chemical analysis, we get longer and longer. I'm just wondering, you also showed your, your own uh, guideline. Why is there not mentioned any bioassays or is there bioassay mentioned in your guideline? No, uh, because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's really pop, pop in products. Uh, I think we could mention, ah, we have for sure the, the case studies on the prominated uh, uh, dioxins um, in, in the toys, yeah, and there are also the, the bioassays mentioned. So this means in Annex 2, yeah, we have included uh, the, the, the prominated dioxin screening. Um, but uh, uh, for... Uh, PBDEs, uh, can you use your bioassay for quantification of PBDEs? I mean, really quantification? I, I think we could we could use the, the, the anti-air for the anti-air for that, but we have not yet that because I, I think the, the question is it's not the question, it's not the PBD risk assessment wrong because you have not integrated the, the risk of dioxins, polypromenated dioxins, you know? No, no, that's clear. Yeah, but I mean, you know, when, when we go now, for example, you said, yes, so for your um, method, you have tested uh, chlorinated paraffins, for example. Yeah? yeah. So there you can have toxicity. And for the PBDEs, you have shown a very wide range of activities in different uh, bioassays, right? Yeah. But uh, uh, have have you done a kind of uh, because these were single PBDEs, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So have you done then also testing of of plastic with those uh, uh, effects for 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 the additives? I mean, for to. Yeah, you currently I submitted a paper for for again for the polypromidate dioxins in PBD. In I have to say there are many different prominent frame metal in that. Toxitizing with zero products. And we used for this case, we used the tetra prom bisphenol A biocide, this is TTA TR calogs, and the DR calogs. But not for each, not for the sum of the PBD. I mean, you're right, it should be done. You know, it's easy to do, you know. Um, yeah, you know, I showed these four samples what we do what we do with in your project, Roland. And this is the similar approach you would use for that. And there is actually the air and anti I use. So let's say the other one, if the anti-IR colors is negative in that four materials, then I don't think there are, there are high levels of PBDEs in it. Okay, good. So Peter, uh, I think you can also put some links in the chat if you like. Yeah, you said you mentioned your guidance. 
Um, I don't know if the, if it's online, uh, you can put it in the in the chat, or if uh, your publications on uh, brominated dioxins and PBDEs uh, in toys uh, have a have a web link, you can also uh, put it here in the in the chat that uh, participants uh, can can download and can have a, a a look at it. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Thank so now we come to our last speaker. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Ms. Sandra Averu Monnery uh, from U United Nations Environmental Programme. She is a program officer in the Chemicals and Health Branch at UNEP in Geneva and works on the chemicals agenda, in particular leads on chemicals in products, including buildings, textiles, toys, and electronics, but also on chemicals in plastic and green and sustainable chemistry. So the last three years, I had the pleasure to work together with, uh, with Sandra uh, on our publication on chemicals in, in plastic uh, technical report, which has just been uh, uh, published. So this really made me happy. Uh, now over to you, Sandra. Thank yes. you very much, Roland. Thanks so much for um, for the introduction. And uh, I have to say, I'm very happy to uh, with the uh, the release of the report and uh, and the welcome that it has received so far. So, uh, warm thanks to you and to um, all the team of authors. <laughs> um, so, well, I, I wanted to um, to make some concluding remarks to this uh, webinar series as we are reaching uh, the end of uh, this informative and, and thought-provoking webinar on POPs in plastics and on monitoring approaches. And to thank each and every one of you for your active participation and, and valuable contribution throughout this session. Um, we know that there is a current process for developing an international legally binding instrument treaty to end plastic pollution. And um, the INC2 um, round of negotiation is about to meet in Paris next week. And, and I would like to, to raise right here um, the importance of chemical in plastics and, uh, and the fact that it is an important part to address um, the to address and the control of pops and other chemicals of concern in plastics in particular are important to address the and and reach ending the plastic pollution to protect human health in the environment and also are important for a safe circularity of plastics um, as uh, mentioned by Roland, a recent UNEP report has been released on chemicals in plastics, and uh, I'll be happy to provide you the link as soon as I'm finished. Um, and it has found that uh, 13,000 chemicals are associated with plastics and plastic production across a wide range of uh, applications, of which over 3,200 substances are of potential concern due to their hazardous properties. And several are POPs, and several are POPs actually newly listed in the Stockholm Convention since uh, 2009 um, as plastics additives and as POPs. Um, in this report, 10 groups of chemicals of concern have been identified, uh, and a number of these groups uh, include POPs, such as PFAS, or flame retardants, or UV stabilizers, but also other chemicals that are not covered by international treaty today. So we very much look forward to uh, the negotiation uh, related to the plastics treaty. Um, in parallel and in, in addition, the recent round of UNEP Jeff Hop's global monitoring project has analyzed 900 biotic and abiotic samples collected all over the world in 42 countries and detected concerning level of POPs additives, which indicated the potential impact of POPs in plastics on the health of humans and the environment. So I think um, across this webinar, um, many would agree that scientific knowledge 
and the analytical capacity are really crucial to address the presence of pops in plastics and its impact on our planet, in particular now to contribute to this ongoing negotiation for the UN Treaty to end plastic pollution. And so with these webinars, we've had the opportunity to get an overview of the pop group and other chemicals of concern in plastics related human ex exposure, environmental pollution, to delve into screening and sampling strategies to discuss methods, techniques, and plastic samples for pop analysis, as well as the instrumental analysis of major pop groups. And the discussion on these webinars have highlighted the crucial role of measuring the presence of POPs in plastics in supporting the objective of the Stockholm Convention and the emerging need to address plastic pollution. So robust monitoring efforts are of great importance to understand the extent of POPs contamination in plastics and to devise effective strategy for their mitigation. In the reports that are above mentioned, there are some specific uh, levers and, and actions that are put forward uh, for addressing um, chemicals in plastic. And furthermore, POPs monitoring in plastics can contribute to the assessment, to the assessing the compliance with the convention's provision, tracking progress, and advising effective policies and action. The diverse perspective and expertise shared by um, esteemed experts and presenters here today and, and the previous day have shed light on the latest research finding, innovative technique, and good practice on POPs monitoring. And these are really valuable insights um, for UNEP and for all of us, um, enriching our understanding of this critical issue and paving the way for collaboration and action. Our collective effort really extends far beyond these webinars, and uh, it's really important to carry forward the knowledge that has been gained today and the other days into daily practice, whether it is on policy making, on waste management, on manufacturing processes. By incorporating effective monitoring and management strategies, we can collectively work towards reducing the presence of pops in plastics, safeguarding the environment, protecting human health, and alignment in alignment with the Stockholm Convention. So thanks a lot to all the organizers, to Roland Weber and the IPCP, and the dedicated team who have been making this webinar series possible. Your hard work and commitment in spreading awareness on POPs monitoring in plastics and supporting the UNEP Jeff POPs monitoring, Global Monitoring Plan project are really commendable. And I encourage all participants to stay connected and to continue engaging in discussions, in research, in collaboration, to advance the field of both monitoring in plastics and of chemicals of concern in plastics. Together, we do have the power to create positive impact and to contribute to address and end plastic pollution, protecting the health of human and the environment from the negative effects on POPs and pave the way for a safer and more sustainable future. We hope to continue this monitoring journey together. So thank you once again for your very active participation and looking forward to continued collaboration in this shared mission on monitoring POPs and combating POPs contamination in plastics. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sandra. I mean, first, yes, for this very nice uh, concluding words, um, but also for the, the good cooperation uh, from UNEP, I mean, for the, for the report, but also for, for this uh, a monitoring project. I think, uh, yes, this can only be a start um, we see that for we, we, we have some information for these uh, few pops, yeah, but uh, we know that there is much, much more out there. Uh, we know that there is much capacity building needed in, in, in developing country. And uh, yes, we are happy that we could contribute now with these webinars, which are all recorded. And I recommend to people 
if they have not seen the, the first one on, on the backgrounds and so on, to visit the IPCP uh, website. And uh, I wish all listeners uh, also, let's say, good progress in their endeavor uh, to address uh, uh, plastic, plastic pollution and improve the circular economy of uh, plastics. So this is it from me, Anna. Do you also want to say a greeting from IPCP side? And uh, is there a possibility yes, of participants I, I... maybe to become members of, of, of IPCP? I don't know how this is uh, uh, handled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can address that as well. But yes, first let me add um, to your thanks. Um, first of all, thanks to uh, you, Roland, for organizing it all, and to UNEP and Jeff for the support, um, for all the presenters and collaborators, uh, without which we couldn't um, have done this. Um, and, and, and thanks to all the participants for sticking in with, you know, quite intense and uh, long days. Um, we will uh, post the recordings of the, the last part, part three of the webinar series shortly on our website. So uh, feel free to refer others um, there. And if you're looking for future updates on this project or any activities from IPCP, um, please visit our website or also follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. And for um, to answer your question, Roland, how to join IPCP, IPCP is open for membership to academic um, scientists um, and there are uh, there's an application process on our website um, for those interested in joining um, so yeah thanks a lot again and uh, this makes me feel very encouraged <laughs> about the way forward for addressing um, apps and plastics um, throughout the globe thank you okay yeah so then we progress all together yeah um wish you a good time and uh, from us goodbye thank you